All right, welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who I have not met before, my name is McLean Bright Macklin. I'm the VP of Policy and Impact at Health Forward. It's so nice to see you all here today as we share our policy agenda with you all. Uh, first, wanna give some shout outs to the folks that actually made this happen. I'm just here as window dressing. Uh, Nate Madden, who's over here trying to troubleshoot our, our pointer. Uh, Alicia, who's sitting back here, Wizard of Oz style behind the curtain, making all the virtual things happen. Uh, we've got Estuardo and Ross from our policy, or sorry, not our policy team, our comms team, uh, who have been instrumental in setting all this up. And then also want to acknowledge Kiana Thomas and our CEO and Irene, our board chair. Uh, so if I wasn't nervous already, I certainly am now. <laughs> Uh, so we are here this morning to share uh, an agenda that has been months in the making. Uh, you all might know, we'll click to the next slide, please. Um, we spent over a year now uh, in purpose realignment uh, and are adjusting not only our grant making to our new purpose, but also our policy agenda and orienting all of our work around our new purpose. And so we go back. Thank you. So displaying this here, understanding that it is still new to everyone um, and as some context for why we ultimately landed where we did in our policy goals and priorities. Uh, in the months that we took in developing this agenda, uh, we met with many of you all. And so we hope that you see yourselves in uh, the goals and priorities uh, because they are not intended to be our own. They're intended to be a reflection of the needs of the communities that we serve and our partners. Uh, and our ultimate aim is that it's something that we can all uh, rally behind uh, as we work to better align our collective interests and even our individual interests uh, toward you know, greater collective impact. Um, so just want to sort of read aloud uh, some of the key points on this uh, purpose plan, our purpose, is that every day we work to support and build inclusive, powerful, and healthy communities characterized by racial equity and economical justice systems. If I, if I got a tattoo, it would probably be that. <laughs> uh, and we are focused on four areas uh, that are really uh, driving our work uh, in our purpose, uh, place, power, people, and platform, which we'll go into more detail later, but as I'm speaking, if you want to just peruse the strategies and outcomes so you can kind of see where we are focused within those purpose areas. And hopefully, um, if you all can't read the screens, you all picked up copies of the policy agenda when you walked in. If not, they're available. Uh, please feel free to, uh, to follow along. Uh, and then our intended impact, which is or which are high quality, equitable community health ecosystem, strong community organizations and voices, and equitable and just places that foster health and economic advancement. The policy agenda that you all have in front of you is intended to be uh, a resource in a few ways. Uh, it not only outlines our policy goals and priorities, it also is really dense in the data that supports where we've landed. We've included quotes. Uh, that are intended to reflect the lived experiences of those that we surveyed as a part of this process to better contextualize why we landed where we are and how some of these policy issues are felt. And then there's also a bibliography um, that has the sources for where we pulled all this information so that as you are designing your own testimony or just trying to figure out why we landed where we did, that's there to be a resource for you all as well. So I am going to turn it over to Nate who is going to take us through our surveying process and what we heard from community as we were putting this agenda together. We'll also hear presentations from uh, our lobbyists, both Kansas and Missouri lobbyists, that will share sort of what we can all expect as we prepare for the legislative sessions in Kansas and Missouri. And then we'll have uh, Leslie from Boulder Advocacy who will walk us through some of the IRS and ethical sort of considerations. Uh, so that we're all uh, geared up and ready to go once the session starts. So Nate, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, McLean. Um, and just so you know, we are uh, doing a simulcast, I guess it's called, uh, with um, a webinar participants. So hi, everyone. Um, uh, and, and because of that, we're sort of, 
if you're speaking, you're going to see us up here at the mic uh, so they can see us at the camera and hear us uh, on everything. So that's why we're not sort of hopping around the stage and everything. Um, I did want to just sort of set the table a, a little bit about the why of why we're here. Um, just talk about some of uh, the basics of the day too. Um, I think the, the main reasons why we're here, number one, we've put a lot of work into our policy agenda and we want to share that out with you all. Um, and as McLean said, we our intention is, is hopefully that you see some of yourself and, and you and your organization's work in this as well, because we were very intentional and it took a, a, a lot more time and effort, but we were intentional about speaking with as many of our partners um, and, and members of the community as possible to help inform this. Um, and you'll notice on the, in the back of the agenda or that we are on one of the pages of the agenda, we have uh, acknowledgements for everyone who participated um, in our uh, community listening session and one-on-one and, uh, uh, -on -one, uh, conversations that we had. We also wanted, since we have everyone in the room, uh, to bring in some of our partners from Kansas and Missouri who have their ear to the streets on in the legislatures and under each uh, respective dome to help set the table for what is coming, uh, likely coming in this session, um, and to also just go through the nuts and bolts of, of what might be different, especially since we just came through an election year. So there might be some some contextual things that have changed to sort of uh, that that might be worth uh, worth you knowing as you you plan your own advocacy work, uh, and then then to cap things off, we'll be doing a, a sort of a capacity build. Uh, as McLean mentioned, um, one of our partners at uh, Boulder Advocacy will be running through some of the nuts and bolts of of advocacy as nonprofits, as well as uh, you know thinking about sustaining the work. How, how is it funded? How is it supported? Um, I, I'm not going to march us through the agenda here, but the, the main thing worth mentioning here is that uh, from 11.30 to 12.30 is, is sort of our lunch period. It's a taco bar. I'm very excited about it, so I hope you are too. Uh, that's why we went with a little lighter breakfast so you can load up on that. Um, we will, it, it'll be sort of a working lunch because we got a lot jam-packed in here today, so uh, um, get ready to, to eat and listen. Um, and uh, I think uh, some, some sort of housekeeping issues uh, if you um, are, are wanting to sort of get up and move around, get out uh, and go to a different location, there's a, there is a little balcony up here with some seating, um, at, right, right if you come in the room here uh, and you get to that by either the elevator or going up the stairs here and, and you can go just catch your own spot. Apparently it's, it's nice and warm up there. So if you're a little cold blooded, you can use that as a, as a way to sort of get some respite. Um, bathrooms are, I completely forgot to check where the bathrooms are. So if, yeah, thank you. Crowdsourcing the bathroom locations. Appreciate that everybody. Um, and uh, please don't feel like you have to sort of wait for a break to, if you need to get up and move around, this is as free flowing as possible. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not demanding that you be at attention at all times, but, but please do, um, uh, you know, if you must take a call or anything, just uh, step out of the, the room um, so, so we don't disrupt any presentations or, or people watching. Um, okay, so I'm here to, my, my piece of the pie is on the policy agenda development process. And McLean and I worked really closely together on this and a, with a lot with our partners uh, to help put, pull this together, but it sort of started right after the session ended um, in, in Missouri in May of last year, we really began to pick up steam on the work. Um, and the first step, uh, it always seems to be a survey, but I'm proud to say that's just our first step and not our first and last step. We are very, um, we are keen on ensuring that there, the, these discussions are fully fledged out, that people are, are given a chance to not only give us some feedback through a survey, uh, but also get a chance to say it in their own words as well. So we sent the survey out to 111 different people and partner organizations uh, to get their, their input on you know, how aware of certain issues that we 
um, are, are focusing on as, as the Health Forward Foundation are they? And also how much advocacy are you doing on those issues uh, as well? We had really good turnout for it. I mean, I've done a lot of surveys in my life and getting uh, like 60, almost 70% uh, response rates for uh, a survey that you send out online is pretty darn good. So I would thank you all for who, who uh, participated in that and for filling that out. Um, we took and compiled those results. Uh, it was sort of a mix of, of qualitative and quantitative uh, data. And we said, this, th this is only, if we just read this now and we, we started kicking out a policy agenda based on this, this would be only us interpreting this. So that feels incomplete. That doesn't feel right. And we bandied about the idea of bringing in the people who filled out the survey um, and going a level deeper with them. And we hosted them in late August um, at the Gift Business Center, which shout out to Gift. If you're not familiar, they're, they're doing excellent work um, and they have a great facility and location for incubating a nonprofit or a small business or hosting a moderate to small size convening. Um, and we brought everyone together there and we, we focused in on the survey results and really wanted to hear more. Uh, one of the things we, we asked several different questions. We sure we posted up the results of the survey and got more uh, feedback on that. But we also um, asked other broader questions. You know, what? How are you centering uh, racial equity and justice in your advocacy work? And we got incredible feedback on that. Um, we, we also asked folks, uh, how can Health Forward be a better partner to you? in your advocacy work, because we, we need to know, we need to hear directly. And I think by the way that we structured everything, we were, we were able to get really authentic feedback and uh, those, those results are really in depth and um, I, I'm happy to share those out at some other point. That would take probably the rest of the day if we did that right now. So um, then what we did was uh, uh, moved on to uh, sort of having a little bit more one-on-one -on -one conversation and dialogue with people who either couldn't attend or, you know, whom we were we were thinking after uh, the the sending out the survey and having the listening session, um, you know, we need to we need to talk to these partners and, and get a sense of of their idea on um, how how their work is sort of driving uh, is 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 in tandem with ours and also helping answer some of those big questions that we asked folks at the community sense-making session. And uh, after we did all that, we, um, we, we, we got down to business. We started typing away, um, you know, lots of document editing. You all know how that goes. It feels good, um, it, it, but it's a lot of work. And so through October and November, we were uh, in, in the midst of, of pulling all that information together and, and really, uh, you know, thinking about our own priorities as well and, and putting it into a policy agenda. And that is what you have sitting in front of you today is, is our policy agenda for uh, 2023, 2024 for the states of Missouri and Kansas. Oop, I got this one working, just so you know. Um, I, so because everyone loves a word cloud, um, we made one. And I just want you to know that this is inclusive of those survey results, the sense-making sessions. I took all the, I, I hand entered in all the responses from the uh, literally hundreds of post-it notes um, and put it into, into a Word doc, um, the one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I sent it to a word cloud generator and this is what we got. Um, and I think you'll see some of the things are, are some of that you see up here are the most urgent pressing needs of our time, you know, affordable housing, but also a lot of what people are, are, are putting up here and showing is, uh, is, is talking about like access to health, uh, education, education, not about like going to school education, but like educating policymakers, educating people in the community, ed educating other organizations, um, doing, uh, doing work uh, in community, um, and these things all sort of kept coming, uh, coming up as a, as a recurring theme. And so it was really, it, this feels like, it doesn't feel 
like this is all it boiled down to it feels like this was this it really is the the culmination of all those conversations that we had and and the rich depth uh, that we were able to to get from from being able to uh, to to sit down and, and take our time with this rather than 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 rush it together. So with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to McLean and she can go over. Uh, what you have in front of you in the policy agenda and sort of add a little more flavor and, and, and depth to, to the conversation. So just want to contextualize these slides. Um, what you'll see are some of the, the data points that help to substantiate where we ultimately landed uh, and provide sort of the, 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 the factual uh, data-driven basis for a lot of what we heard when we were having uh, the conversations and doing the surveying and doing the community sense making. So um, in our people area is where a lot of our uh, health forward traditional work lives in the area of access to health. Um, and so uh, within the strategies that are outlined in that, that, that uh, placemat document that was the first slide, uh, things in the realm of uh, telehealth, telemedicine, Medicaid expansion, um, access to quality, affordable health care, um, live in this area, uh, diversifying the healthcare workforce. And so um, really wanted to dig deep, look at the data, ensure that the data supported where we landed. And so this is just an example of, of why uh, focusing on um, access to care is important given the disparities that are highlighted by the data uh, and the needs that are highlighted by the data. And so where we ultimately landed uh, is a people-related goal of uh, people being able to easily access safe, quality, and affordable whole-person care. Our uh, policy priorities uh, to advance that goal are uh, health care that is accessible, affordable, and high quality, ensuring there is no quality without equity and no equity without quality. Healthy whole foods that are affordable, accessible, and reimbursable by payers for their medicinal qualities. Healthcare in all its forms is provided by a culturally responsive, diverse, and anti-racist healthcare workforce. Community health worker services that are reimbursable by payers and regarded as healthcare. And telehealth services that achieve parity in care and coverage and are continuously reimbursable for healthcare providers. And those of you who uh, are already tracking the bills that were pre-filed in Missouri or know what was filed last year in Kansas and anticipating what will be filed, this should be reflective of a lot of what you've already seen, what we know is coming. Um, and so we're working with our lobbyists to track um, bills related to these things in the realm of like SNAP and TANF access, um, in the realm of MCO contracts in Kansas and making sure that that's an equitable process um, in the realms of community health worker certification and the uniformity of their, their trainings um, and the ongoing pursuit of Medicaid expansion in, in Kansas for which we are unrelenting. Uh, and so we're happy to share our bill tracker sheet with you all. It is a part of our monthly blog that goes out during session so that you can see what we're tracking um, and so that you know you know if there's something that you are leading on that you want to engage us in that we'd be more than willing to do that uh, and that we'll be reaching out to you all in the same vein. So additional data points um, and uh, sort of substantiating factoids in our in our power area. Power is where we are focused on increasing uh, engagement in democracy and civic participation, understanding that, um, you know, the ultimate goal, I think, for anyone is self-determination, and we can't have self-determination if we aren't able to make decisions for ourselves or to elect those that represent our interests. And so uh, the primary way of ensuring that is through uh, the voting process, through the initiative petition process, uh, and through just ensuring that we're adequately represented in our elected bodies. So our goal in this area is that participation in our democracy and policy making process improves health outcomes. And our prior priorities are that all citizens can vote or participate in the democratic process without barriers, 
all citizens are fairly represented by and in our elected bodies and local jurisdictions have reasonable authority to promote and protect public health. So bills that we will be tracking uh, that relate to these uh, priorities would include um, you know, local authority, including local health authority uh, for our public health departments to make reasonable decisions, timely decisions without having to wait for the state or federal legislators to act. Um, any changes to the initiative petition process that could be unreasonable or make it more difficult for folks to um, directly engage um, in, in our lawmaking in that way or any of the multitude of laws that were introduced last year that are being reintroduced this year that would um, limit our ability to, to vote. So our place focus area is where we have attempted to really hone in on the social uh, influencers of health, understanding that there are many, understanding that really every aspect of our life uh, has the uh, capacity to impact our health, um, but that we are, resource limited, time limited, and so wanted to focus our efforts, concentrate our efforts where we thought we were uniquely positioned uh, to do some good and also areas of, of, of really high need. And so those areas are in the realm of housing affordability um, toward the end of home ownership, understanding that home ownership has been the primary way of generating wealth within our communities. And then also uh, in the realm of access to broadband. Uh, broadband has recently been dubbed the, social, the super social determinant of health uh, because it uh, dictates our ability to access all forms of our economy in this uh, you know, 21st century. Uh, and so again, some data points um, that help to uh, illuminate uh, why these two areas are so important, those of home ownership. Uh, and those of broadband access and how they are impacting lives and widening disparities that exist in our communities. So our goal in this area is for communities that are healthy places where people fully participate in the digital economy and build wealth through safe, quality, and affordable housing and home ownership. Our priorities are safe housing and home ownership that's available, affordable, and accessible, housing policies, uh, that reduce racial home ownership gaps and create mixed income neighborhoods and protect against displacement and the digital economy and the tools and training required to use it are available, affordable, and accessible. So again, things that we'll be tracking uh, based on what's been introduced in Missouri, as an example, are changes to MHDC or in both Kansas and Missouri, any changes to the low income housing tax credit uh, program, um, any um, uh, bills that would provide funding to or task forces that are set up uh, to make uh, broadband more accessible or to build out broadband infrastructure and in communities are things that we would be tracking. Um, and those things that I've listed, not an exhausted list. Um, when you see our bill tracker, not an exhaustive list. It's been our best attempt. But if there are things that come up that you all come across that you want to make us aware of that we might not be aware of, we hope that you will bring us into the fold uh, as a willing partner. And then our fourth focus area, our purpose area is that of platform. And in the area of platform is where we are really focused on uh, narrative change, um, changing the narratives and how uh, these communities that we work with um, are talked about, uh, are seen, and really even in some instances how um, they see themselves. Um, these communities are asset rich and we are uh, no longer willing to speak of them um, in deficit based language and are encouraging others uh, to do the same. Um, we're also um, hell bent, if I can say that, on um, ensuring that the stories and voices of the folks in these communities are not only lifted up, but like front row and center in the conversations that we're having and ensuring that we involve community and really follow community and all the work that we're doing. Um, and including those stories and that approach in our calm strategies and the ways that we talk about these issues, both internally and externally. Um, but at its root, it's a recognition um, that racism is at the root of um, all disparities. Uh, and so wanting to eliminate racism in all policy is really undergirding our work in, uh, in our platform area. And so again, some data points that sort of speak to uh, what's lending to um, and what are the outcomes of some of those racial disparities that exist um, in our laws and in our ways of thinking. 
So our goal in our platform area is uh, community health uh, is influenced by systems, policies, and stories that promote racial equity and economic inclusion. And our priorities are that race because of racism no longer influences health outcomes. Race equity is pursued in all policies and disaggregated public health data centers, racial and ethnic identities and leads to more equitable resource allocation and the eradication of health injustices. So we can pause here for some questions uh, about where we've landed or anything that you saw. Um, and you know, if questions don't automatically come to you, um, know that we are here. Uh, and know that we want to work with you all on these things. And so if they bear greater explanation, uh, if we haven't provided sufficient context, uh, we're more than willing to do so. Um, it's what you see here should be a reflection, um, not only of what we heard from many of you in this room, but also what we know is percolating uh, both locally uh, and on the state level and federal levels in, in terms of policy making but also some things that are being considered in um, our corporate institutions. Uh, for example, um, time off, pay time off to vote. Um, we're also paying close attention to corporate policies and practices, hoping that we can be of influence and exert some leadership there as well. So we are uh, really trying to pursue systems change in any way that we can. Uh, the first few pages of our policy agenda are intended to demonstrate how we are wanting to show up in the policy and advocacy space. So, you know, if you're there and you need us, call us because we are more than willing to engage with you as we collectively pursue uh, change and advancement in our community. So uh, we next have up our Kansas, well, sorry, pause for questions. Yes. I was wondering, uh, will, okay, will these amazing slides be accessible? Yes, we will send out the slides post uh, this convening. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for that lovely overview. This may be premature, uh, but with all the brouhaha about critical race theory in the legislature, uh, how are we going to address that or even try to educate folks who are not really interested in listening? Right, yeah, and I, I think I failed to mention some of the bills that we'd be tracking in our platform area. That's one, as well as legislation related to the Crown Act um, or anything where it's very clear that, you know, racism is embedded, even if thinly veiled uh, therein. Um, certainly an issue that we intend to uh, educate folks about. Um, and hopefully one where, you know, I don't know if your organization is is, is leading or intending to do any plan advocacy around that issue, but certainly something we'd be interested in engaging on. And I don't know if anybody else in the room has an interest in or would like to speak to that. John. Hey, good morning, John Wilson of Kansas Action for Children. I, I think that's a great point. And so Kansas Action for Children uh, uh, is around the Kansas State Capitol all session. Every moment lawmakers are there, we're there, and we're not an all white organization, uh, but I think we play an important role in helping primarily white audiences in the legislature, all 165 lawmakers, understand issues like that better. And we have a commitment as an organization to kind of have the patience needed to walk alongside these lawmakers because I am convinced that most of them don't go to church, go to civic organizations or workplaces that are helping them understand this. So if nobody is doing that, then of course they're going to have hurtful and uh, uh, distorted perceptions about things. And so that's part of our commitment as equity as an organization. And I know other organizations who are in the capital who have called advocacy work are willing to, to do that as well. So thank you, FDC. Any other questions before we turn it over to our Kansas Lobbyists, we've got a question over here. Oh, I'm sorry. A quick question. I'm lost. Okay, um, I see you now. In regards to the broad, broadband access policy focus, is that um, something that you're seeing primarily on infrastructure build out, or is there attention also being paid to houseless populations that we know have super limited access to resources because of 
that limitation. Yeah, my understanding is that there's funding available both for infrastructure, but in more limited funding available for like digital literacy sort of training and affordability issues. Um, there's a lot of money coming from uh, the federal level that the states will then have to apply for and then localities will have access to, uh, but the application has not even yet gone live. And so from Health Forward's vantage point, not only are we advocating in the legislature for these funds and how these funds should be distributed, but also wanting to make some of our dollars available to help folks in the application process, whether it's you know grant making support or other technical assistance to make sure they're well positioned. Um, I also understand that there'll be a need for some matching dollars. So we're exploring whether or not we can show up in that space as well. No promises, I haven't you know, solidified that yet with, uh, but we're, but we're working to be creative and thoughtful about how um, we can be of support to ensure that folks um, not only have access to broadband to their doorstep, but once it's there, they can then afford it and avail themselves of it. All right, I just have a quick question. So mm -hmm. as we go forward with um, you know, the challenge to individual agencies is clear. Is there a plan now to help facilitate collective that so that there would be investment in bringing us together to address this rather than just challenging it, but actually helping us? So, um, want to make sure I understand your question. Um, thinking directed at Health Forward specifically and our ongoing yeah. commitment to continue bringing people together to not only educate, but some um, collective advocacy on these issues or others. Yes, definitely. Um, as an example, and don't want to steal Nate's thunder, but we have a day at the Capitol plan for uh, January 26th in, in Kansas. Uh, where we'll be charting in a bus to go uh, to meet with our delegation uh, for lunch to talk about uh, policy around community health workers and then spend in the afternoon uh, talking to other legislators about some key issues that we've identified in the realms of um, uh, food sales tax, uh, voting rights, and then I'm going to forget the third. So that's just one example of what we intend to be ongoing engagement, ongoing support, ongoing bringing folks together to talk about issues and troubleshoot and strategize together. Um, but in terms of what the needs are that we can help to meet all ears on how we can, you know, best be of support um, in, you know, getting together as a collective and moving things forward. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I uh, wanted to ask um, with regards to um, housing piece and parts around um, trying to expand housing options, um, will that also include um, helping, uh, potentially helping local advocates to advocate for things for them? It will make it easier to build new types of housing. Uh, I would anticipate so. So I, you know, um, historically our advocacy has uh, focused uh, pretty highly on the state level. In the last couple of years, we have shifted to an increasing focus on advocacy on the local level, understanding that you know the local policy is the hardest felt, um, and where issues such as zoning, such as economic development, and sentence as another example, or um, issues that relate to our public health departments, uh, even the establishment of an office of race equity in Kansas City, Missouri, um, are derived and implemented, and so. Uh, we in our power area and in our attempts to support increased civic participation will likely be uh, doing some grant making to support organizations that intend to do advocacy around issues such as that, but then also showing up as Health Forward and with our partners to do advocacy as well. So mine is not a question, but a thank you for doing all the hard work that helps guide us and for being a leader. Because when I went through this, this is just so awesome that we have guidelines now to take back to our community to help guide us. So thank you. I appreciate that. And really on behalf of Nate and myself, Kiana, the whole Health Forward team, you all guided us. Um, and that's why we spend so much time and Nate dug into the lengths to which we went to engage with community because we don't see this agenda as our own. We see it as 
uh, the communities, or at least we hope it's a reflection of community priorities. And so glad to hear that we were somewhat successful in that. And Kiana had a question. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick response in addition to the claims on the zoning question that you asked. So one of the things that the agendas represent is a nexus uh, of the community's interests with ours, um, understanding that it can't be all inclusive. Many of the organizations that we fund with cooperating uh, and with advocacy dollars like the Urban Neighborhood Initiative are focusing specifically on inclusionary zoning policies and practices. You may hear it as, at least in Kansas City, the set cycle for developers, if they get tax abatements, they'll get have to a dedicated percentage of um, their units to people at a certain AMI. Uh, and so while we may not have specific language in our policy agenda regarding that, many of the organizations that have been funding in this room you're working on that, right? So just wanted to highlight that as an example. I think we have time for probably one more question. The claim on the, on the hot spot. Hi, Margaret from Kansas City Public Library. And I don't have a question so much as a, a comment that I really appreciate the intentional focus on shifting toward an, an asset focus in storytelling and deleting the deficit language from our communications about uh, individuals and communities that have high need. And as communicators in this and in this public realm and all individuals who are working on these on what in similar topics, I wonder if um there would be an opportunity for some storytelling telling training and communications training that allows us to shift toward uplifting stories rather than stories that highlight or reinforce the deficits or challenges? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, period. Um, uh, something that uh, our, our comms team is, is, is working on, intending to do, um, knowing that it's definitely gonna take an, an army uh, to shift mindsets uh, and hearts uh, and acknowledging that even the way we've been talking about people is wrong. So, so yes, more time. All right, that's it for me. I feel very much exposed behind the <laughs> podium. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my seat. Uh, here you go, Nick. Thank you, McLean. And thanks for all the great questions. I love how it takes only about two or three before we're already starting to dig into the policy wonkery. So that's how we all know we're in a room with, with all of our, uh, all of our like-minded people. Um, before I uh, bring in our uh, uh, partners from Kansas to come up and do the Kansas legislative outlook, uh, I did want to mention that there are uh, note cards on the table. They're, they're kind of modified question cards. Um, so if you're if you're not one to sort of throw your hand up and demand the mic, please write down a question on there, and we will do our best to uh, get to that and address that uh, throughout the day as well. Um, and don't worry, we have more than just the one in front of you, so it's not one and done. Um, uh, so our next uh, portion of our programming today. Uh, we'll be going uh, and looking at the Kansas Legislative Outlook for 2023. Uh, with us today, we have Jennifer Crow and Carrie Gooch of Summit Strategies. Uh, they are a government, uh, Summit Strategies is a government relations firm uh, in Kansas, and both uh, Jennifer and Carrie have a wealth 
of experience in all aspects, public policy, uh, government relations, politics, and lobbying, uh, and they are very plugged in. So let's uh, welcome them up here so they can help set the table. Hey, good morning, everybody. There we go. Right. <laughs> My name is Kerry Gooch. Uh, like Nate said, I am with the Summit Strategies. Myself and Jennifer Crow are, have had the opportunity for the last three years, I think now, uh, to work with Health Forward Foundation um, in the Kansas capital. So we're excited to talk to you guys a little bit about what's going on in Kansas, the political outlook, and where we think this next upcoming legislative session is going. So I am first gonna just start with a big picture, kind of the level set to talk about where we are right now in Kansas. Uh, we just came off this big election year. And it's funny enough, I was at another presentation a couple weeks ago, and so I kind of stole this line. And someone basically said, we ended up pretty much where we started uh, last year after this election. So it's funny, after the millions and billions of dollars that were spent on both sides of the aisles campaigning, we're pretty much exactly where we were before. Uh, we ended up with, with a Democratic governor again, Warren Kelly, uh, but also ended up with a supermajority in both the House and the Senate. So again, another two to four years at least of divided government. Kansas legislature. Um, and what that looks like is we have 29 Republicans in the Senate, 11 Republicans in that, or 11 Democrats in the House, and then 85 Republicans in the House and 40 Democrats in the Senate. Another really contentious type of election that we had this year in Kansas was around the Supreme Court justices. Um, and there was lots of, there's been actually a lot of movement over the last four years about retaining or not retaining Supreme Court justices and a lot of focus and money spent on those races as well. And, and Kansas, again, ended up exactly where we were before. All the Supreme Court justices got retained after kind of a big fight over that. We expect for that to continue to be a conversation in Kansas about how we elect and how we select our Supreme Court justices. And it seems like over the last 10 years almost that that conversation has hyped up a little bit more, in particular around some of the decisions that the court has made, whether it be around abortion laws, or whether it be around redistricting or some things like that. So we're gonna, we expect to continue to see a push and shift for a potential change about how we select our Supreme Court justices. Thank you. Um, key takeaways, I kind of talked a little bit about some of this already. You know, first thing starts with, there was no red wave, there was no blue wave. Again, we kind of just ended right where we started here in Kansas. You know, usually in Kansas, what we see in particular in these, what we call off-year elections, these non-presidential elections, we usually see more of a shift for a Republican um, turnout being a little bit higher versus what the Democrat turnout ends, ends up being. Uh, we kind of usually see more of a conservative elect electors show up for off year elections versus presidential elections. We see more of a, of a Democratic elector. But we kind of saw no real wave of either. Again, it kind of it's ended up being pretty much the exact same of what it's looked like before. What we have seen, though, in Kansas happen is more of a shift between the urban, suburban voters versus the rural voters. Right, we have 105 counties across the state of Kansas, and what we are seeing more and more and more, these urban counties are having a larger and larger and larger impact when it comes to elections. Even after going through the redistricting process, you know, we saw so many more of these urban cities and counties um, have more state legislators now, and so there are more and more and more of these urban suburban areas are having a larger impact on what the elections in the states are. Uh, we also saw a little bit of a residual effect from the August election. So in Kansas this last year, we had a big amendment, constitutional amendment on the ballot this year around abortion access in Kansas. Um, and that amendment ended up failing 60% to 40%, I believe, um, in the in vote of no. And we saw a humongous turnout in that election. Actually saw almost a larger turnout in the primary election than almost in the general election, which is very unusual for us here in Kansas. Uh, so we thought, we think some of that had a lingering effect of what actually happened in November with it kind of keeping still with everything else. Um, another thing that I, I uh, often talk about um, that because it gets talked about so much during the elections here in Kansas is Sam Brownback, who was the former governor of the state of Kansas, still played a pretty big role in this election. Uh, like him or dislike him, you know, his voters still showed out and the people that aren't happy with him still showed out. So even though the guy hasn't been governor for over four years now, going on, on six years, um, he's still, his impact that he had on the state is still playing a large factor in what's going on here. Uh, another big takeaway, again, a little bit like I just talked about a little bit earlier, when we're seeing a lot more of the urban, suburban areas playing a bigger impact, 
you know, again, Governor Kelly won re-election statewide, but really only carried the vote in a handful of counties. Um, and so you're seeing more and more of these handful of counties that, you know, again, being 105 counties, you don't have to win all 105. You know, if you can run up the, the votes in certain areas versus other areas, you know, you can still win statewide. Um, and this other, this other uh, chart that we have on here kind of just shows also the shift. You know, again, especially in these off-year elections, we usually see more of a conservative shift um, with the voter turnout. But we saw a stronger Democratic turnout than we usually see in off-year elections. Again, wasn't enough to make a major change in what the makeup of the legislature was. It was basically enough to keep the legislature exactly the same, um, which is a difference than what we usually see in these off-year elections. Um, so some, some key factors as we're looking, heading into this next legislative session, some dynamics that will be different. So after every two years, again, all of our House seats are up for, for re-election. And what that means is we have to re-elect new leaders in the House of Representatives. And so we have some new leaders, and I'll talk about a little bit about those um, as we go through. Again, like I said earlier, we also have a supermajority in both the House and the Senate, which means that the Republican legislature can pass and override a governor's veto by just the, their votes of just the Republican party. Uh, so again, that'll be something that we will have to continue to watch to see how the Democrats and how Governor Kelly kind of continues to work with that supermajority um, in the Republican legislature. Another change that we are having to deal with here in Kansas is we have a new attorney general. So our former attorney general, uh, Derek Schmidt, ran for governor against Governor Will Kelly and, and was unsuccessful. But Chris Pobach, who used to be our secretary of state in the state of Kansas, um, ran for a couple other offices, but is now back here as the attorney general. Uh, has already indicated that he wants to have a big presence and make a big shift in some legislative policies, and particularly around voting rights and voting restriction laws. So I know that voting is a big part of Health Board's uh, legislative platform. And so for all of you that are watching voting rights and things like that here in Kansas, I'm sure you're all very familiar already with Chris Kobach. So it'll be interesting to see what type of role he really plays in the legislature and what ideas he has cooked up for us here in Kansas. Um, you know, and another thing like, I like to say, you know, we just came off of a big quote unquote legislative election cycle, but in my opinion, kind of coming from a political background, we're always in a campaign season, right? Even though we just got over an, off of an election, we're already looking for the next two years and, you know, Republicans and Democrats are already talking about the next election, you know, so it'd be interesting to see with Governor Kelly not up for re-election ever again, you know, whether or not, you know, Republicans will already put her in this quote unquote lame duck cycle. Uh, so it's interesting to see again what that dynamic will be between the Republican legislature and the governor after she's now won re-election and cannot run for re-election again. You know, will they consider her a lame duck or will they decide to actually, you know, compromise on some things? So just some key dates for us. Uh, again, I'm excited. January 9th is our first day of session. Again, a couple people, it's like the first day of school. You get to go back and see all your friends and put on your new fancy clothes. And then halfway through the year, you're like, oh my gosh, when is this going to be over? <laughs> so it's exciting. So January 9th, again, it's first day of session. It's when the governor will get sworn in. That's when all the new state legislators will be sworn in. Uh, I think Nate talked about this a little bit earlier. On January 26th, we're going to have the Day on the Hill with the Health Board Foundation. So we're excited to have some people come up and be have a chance to talk to the legislators and the service area provider groups. And then also just some other legislators that are on some interesting and key committees that we are all going to be watching. Um, end of March is where we have our turnaround date. Turnaround for you that don't know is that's basically just when all of the bills are supposed to go from one chamber to the other. Uh, one thing I'll say about the legislature is the rule is the rule until it's no longer the rule. So that things are all always flexible and all things always shifting. But end of March is where, we're, where we should see all the bills go from one chamber to the next. Um, end of the beginning of April is usually what we call the end of a regular session, which takes us to the veto session. Though that's when all the bills should be passed out of both chamber and be sent to the governor for her to have the chance to decide whether or not she's going to sign the bills, not sign the bills, or veto the bills. And then we come back, hopefully at the end of April, for a veto session, and then we have signing die, which is the official ending of the legislative session. So let's just talk briefly again. I, I mentioned this earlier. We have a whole new House leadership structure. Um, as much as things stayed the same, uh, the House, in my opinion, got a little bit more conservative. We saw a couple of moderate Republicans lose their primaries um, in August this election year. Again, not a major shift when you look at Republicans versus Democrats in numbers, but a little bit of a shift when you look at more of the kind of conservative leaning of the legislature. It got a little bit more conservative, which means the leadership is going to be a little bit more conservative. You know, I, I'm sure you all are watching what's happening in the House of Representatives up in Washington, D.C. right now. We're not having that problem here in Kansas, but we could, we could get there. Right? It, it could get something similar to that. So uh, Representative Dan Hawkins is going to be the next speaker, Adam Smith. Um, and again, these are all more conservative type of legislators uh, for, the, for the majority of them. 
Um, and on the flip side, we have a new uh, minority leader in, for the Democrats, Vic Miller, who's from Topeka. Uh, Representative Valdinia Wynn, who is out of KCK, on the, also on the KCK school board as well, uh, will be the assistant minority leader. Then Stephanie Clayton, who's also in uh, Health Fourth Service District, will also be the, um, the whip for the House Democrats. So I'm going to breeze through these. I, we have a couple of slides that just kind of talk about some of the committees that we're going to be watching and who the chairs and the rankings are on those committees. And again, I'll just kind of briefly touch about House appropriations is where we usually talk about a lot of the budget types of issues. Taxation is kind of self-explanatory. Social service and budgets, that's another one. Again, we were going to be paying a lot of attention to as you know as we're working with Health Forward Foundation. Uh, I heard somebody talk earlier about, about critical waste theory. You know, in Kansas, we had a little bit of those types of conversations last year, and we expect to have some of those again come up. We saw a lot of that stuff go through the K-12 budget committee last year um, instead of the regular education committee. Again, that committee, if anything, got more conservative. Uh, Christy Williams, as uh, my understanding, plans on introducing another critical race theory bill as well. What they kind of are pouch pitching this as is a kind of parent's bill of rights. It's kind of what they're calling it here in Kansas. So you probably won't ever really hear them use the term critical race theory. They're using kind of the, some of these other type of language around parents' bills of rights. So again, if you're watching that issue, that'll most likely go to the K-12 budget committee and so the kind of the regular education committee. Uh, we have health and human services, obviously, you know, why that's important to us. You know, that's where in, usually we'll see the push for Medicaid expansion in Kansas go through that committee. Again, it's gone through other places before, but you know, that, that's kind of one of the things. Uh, child welfare and foster care and then uh, house wealth. The House Welfare Reform Committee is a new committee that um, we're interested and a little bit nervous to see uh, what, what they plan on doing in that committee. Uh, they haven't been very transparent about what all issues are going to be going through that committee yet, but most likely it's not going to be things that we're going to be excited about. Um, so it's, again, a committee that we're going to have to keep our eye on in particular. Um, house energies, utilities, and telecommunications, obviously broadband and, and broadband access is going to be super important. And again, with there being so much money flowing into the states uh, from the federal government, just from lots of different places, you know, making sure we have time to, to watch and emphasize, you know, making sure there's access to broadband all across the state, urban areas, rural areas, everywhere is super important to us. Um, and House elections, obviously, again, in particular with Chris Kobach going back into the Attorney General's office, we expect to see House elections to be pretty busy, you know, in particular around banning drop boxes. Um, there was a big push for that two years ago to kind of get rid of and limit the amount of drop boxes and drop box access here in Kansas. So we expect to see some of that type of stuff again. This, this um, Senate leadership, again, this didn't change much. Um, President Pi Masterson, Rick Wilborn, and Larry Alley are still there. Um, Senator Dinah Sykes, who's also in the uh, Health Forward Service area out of Lenexa, is minority leader. And then Senator Letha Falcone is assistant mayor. And again, it's very similar to what we saw on the House side, kind of where we think some of these bills and issues are going to fall into. Uh, ways and means, where we see a lot of budget stuff. Um, education is where we expect to see, again, if there's any critical race theory type of legislation, public health and welfare. The interesting thing about this public health and welfare committee, you know, we've worked a lot to kind of push for some good things um, in that committee. And unfortunately, we've kind of been stuck a lot by the, the chair, Richard Hildebrand. The chair actually announced that he was resigning two days ago. Um, and so we're interested to see what this committee changes. We're hoping for the best uh, that we get a new chair that's more willing to work with us and to, to look at the outlook on different things. But you know, again, with a more Republican legislature, we're, we're not expecting a whole lot of change. Uh, there's also a change with the Senate Utilities Chair. Uh, we have a new chair there as well, uh, Senator Rob Olson, who's also from Johnson County in, in the service district area. So we're excited to work with him on some, on some broadband issues as well. So with that, I am going to stop here, and I think I'm turning it over to Jen, um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about this session. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Crow. I am a partner in Summit Strategies. Thanks, Carrie, for going over all of the nitty gritty about Kansas and where we're headed for this next legislative session. As Carrie said, we began on Monday. So um, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about are hot off the press. I was kind of taking notes as I was, as I was sitting in the back because um, things are kind of rolling out as we head into Monday. Uh, the inaugural ball is on uh, Sunday night, and then the swearing-in will be on Monday. Um, first thing I'd like to talk about is the budget surplus. This is pretty much unprecedented. Uh, we have too much money. Um, of course, of course I can't. Uh, we have too much money. 
We have uh, our ending balance for 2023 for the fiscal year is 2.3 billion. And for 2024, it's 3.2 billion. So um, if you go back to the brownback years, we were in the red. So Governor Kelly has done a really good job of not only balancing the budget, but uh, increasing the revenues and managing the budget so that we have a healthy end balance. Um, as I said, this is a good and bad problem to have. Uh, we're gonna be looking at tax cuts versus spending enhancements. Uh, the food tax elimin elimination acceleration is one thing that is on the table. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we'll definitely see some proposals for business tax cuts. Um, there are definitely, some, especially on the Senate side, there are a number of senators who have already thrown those kinds of ideas on the table. Uh, paying down more debt, which is always a good idea. And then uh, repairing the brownback era damage. As Carrie said, it was still a hot button issue in the election. And uh, there's still a lot to be done on uh, the damage that brownback did. So as far as tax, uh, this issue will go through both tax committees on the House and Senate side. Governor Kelly last year had an ax the sales tax proposal and is, uh, reinventing that for round two this session. Her proposal would ask the tax on food, diapers, and fem feminine hygiene products once and for all. Currently, we have, uh, as of January 1, 6.5% to 4% is what the sales tax went to. This is on the three-year plan that they implemented last year. As far as January 21 to 2024, we go from four to two, and then by 2025, it's eliminated and Governor Kelly's plan would eliminate it all this year. And that's what she tried to do last year. There's some, there's still some fear that although we are flushed with cash, uh, that we will run out of money if we spend it. I mean, not for business tax cuts, but for things like food sales tax, if we spend the money too fast, we may run out of money. I think it has a much better chance this year, given that we have another billion dollars more in the ending balance. Uh, she also is proposing to ask the tax on Social Security by smoothing the tax cliff for seniors. Uh, we have a $75,000 threshold and above a dollar above that, you start paying taxes. So she wants to smooth that out. There are others that want to uh, eliminate that altogether. So that will be an issue that will be uh, discussed a lot in tax. So this proposal provides about $550 million in savings. And that's in addition to the billion dollars in savings from last year. And that will, uh, the plan is take place over the next three years. Education. Uh, we have had a six year plan for the school finance lawsuit. This was the Gannon lawsuit. The Supreme Court ordered the uh, legislature to fully fund schools, said that they were not constitutionally compliant because they did not meet the suitable standard for funding for uh, Kansas schools. So we are on our last year of uh, the school finance core compliance. At this point, we are to keep up with inflation. Last year, we only funded inflation uh, school, our schools at 2.07%. Inflation was at 4.55%. So they're gonna have to revisit that issue and uh, hopefully uh, not something the legislature, the supermajority likes to fund but hopefully bring us uh, up to at least the inflation level and make up that uh, round from last year. This only takes us to the 2009 funding level for base state aid per pupil, but uh, that's better than we were under Brownback. So that is some of the repairing the damage of uh, Brownback's uh, administration. The next uh, education issue is vouchers. This started out looking like uh, low income tax credit scholarships where corporations get a tax credit for providing scholarships to private schools that was implemented, has grown every year. It has now taken also a second piece where educational savings accounts are proposed. This would be at the treasurer's department and uh, they would take the base data per pupil, put it into an account at the treasurer's office and uh, parents could use that money to pay for private school, to use for tutoring, for supplies. It's really nebulous because I'm not really, it's like at the end that they look back and see how you spent it. 
So uh, it's it's an interesting proposal. Um, it's it's uh, the K twelve budget chair is a champion of this and really pushed it last year and got it almost uh, sent over to the Senate, but it was stopped in the House by leadership. But uh, leadership is different this year, and that issue will definitely come back. We talked about critical race theory. Um, you know, this is an effort to sell diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social emotional learning as criti critical race theory. The debate last year ended up in a watered down Parents' Bill of Rights, but we're seeing at the local level a lot of local school boards taking the Parents' Bill of Rights and reading that in much different ways than it was intended. Uh, we also have uh, school boards that have become more conservative uh, with past elections, so this is a hot button issue right there. Uh, we did have something recently in Valley Center where there were some racial slurs that were thrown at Topeka basketball students. So I think that is uh, not a good way, but uh, a telling way to uh, walk into the session with issues like critical race theory on the table. So I think it will have so much, somewhat of a different tenor this session. Um, and as far as these education issues, uh, Karen mentioned this, um, these three issues are in the House K-12 Budget Committee, which is a subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee. We also have a House Education Committee, which has a new chair, but it tends to take on kind of low hanging fruit issues. And the chair uh, K-12 Education Budget was really kind of the school guru for um, all of these different issues. So she gets to take those issues through her, her committee. As far as transgender athletes, uh, has been vetoed by the governor twice. Both of those vetoes were not challenged, so they were sustained. We will see this issue again. Uh, just realize that there was a bill filed in the Senate for a healthcare ban on trans youth. And uh, so that kind of takes a different approach to the issue, and I'm sure that will get a lot of discussion. Okay, on healthcare, uh, Medicaid expansion. This is the issue that the supermajority loves to hate. It was a big election issue. Um, I, I'm sure, as you all know, it's overwhelming, overwhelmingly supported. We're losing about 5.9 billion in federal funding because of the failure to pass Medicaid expansion. Governor Kelly has said that she will propose it again. It's the right thing to do, but uh, the odds are against us. So this issue isn't going away. We still need to continue the ad advocacy, but uh, as far as progress, it, it doesn't look promising. Another issue is the can care contracts. Those are up for renewal this year. Another hot button issue last year, this is big money. We have privatized uh, Medicaid in Kansas. So uh, last year, in order to thwart Governor Kelly's ability to write the RFP for CanCare contracts, they passed a bill that uh, delayed the RFP until the end of this month in the hopes that uh, Derek Schmidt would be able to write the RFP. Unfortunately for them, Derek Schmidt is not governor, so uh, Governor Kelly will continue the process that she has already been on to write the RFP for the can care contracts. As far as telehealth, uh, this is something that is very important to deal with the workforce shortage and the shortage of providers. This will include investment in broadband and those are big issues for Health Forward as you all know. Uh, for mental health, this is a big issue for the House Health Chair, Brenda Landwehr. She uh, commandeered a pilot of uh, mental health workers, community mental health workers that go into schools as teams. And it started as a pilot. She wants to implement that as a permanent program. And I think that will be something that will get a lot of attention. And I think some ideas will probably come out of there as far as uh, community-based workers. Um, abortion was obviously a big issue um, in Kansas due to the primary vote. Uh, nevertheless, despite the overwhelming passage of, uh, or lack of passage of the constitutional amendment, we will see, we've already heard a lot of discussion about abortion. Planned Parenthood recently came out with telemedicine abortion, and uh, Senator Mark Steffen, has, who's a physician, 
has filed a bill to uh, stop that. So that's that's one issue. Uh, telemedicine abortion will be discussed. Uh, the born alive uh, concept, the duty to resuscitate. We've already heard that as something that uh, they plan to look at. Um, as far as the workforce shortage, uh, kind of off to the side, um, Landwehr said recently that she wants to loosen licensing requirements. Um, this was in the context of the Mental Health Beds Committee during the interim. The Department of Health recently implemented a community health worker license, so that's something we'll want to watch. And uh, that could also bring some attention to that profession. Uh, ARPA, this has been something that has uh, been drawn out in Kansas. Uh, we've got uh, a leftover, about half, $374 million in our COVID-19 relief funds. What they're going to do is put these into pots, and those are the four areas that they plan to put in the pot. One of them is health and education. Um, these will be competitive grants uh, uh, that will be uh, issued out of the departments. Um, so if you want to find out more information about that, it's at covid.ks.gov. The SPARC Committee, Strengthening People and Revitalizing, Revitalizing Kansas, was the executive committee that uh, of, of uh, regular citizens and then of uh, legislative leadership. They are the ones and the governor that put together this plan. There's also about $140 million that uh, they've allocated to the legislature. The SPARC committee has asked for that to come back, but that is legislative dis discretion. So there could be another 140 million on top of the 374 million. Okay, so potpourri, um, just kind of the issues that are going to hang out there um, and take up a lot of time. Medical marijuana is one of them. It is held up in the Senate. The Senate president has no interest in moving medical marijuana forward. The House has passed it. Uh, Kelly supports legalization. There was a recent change in chairmanship where the federal and state affairs chair became the utilities chair, which is actually something he likes more. And the utilities chair, Mike Thompson from this area, became the uh, federal state affairs chair. Mike Thompson is vehemently against medical marijuana. So that kind of gives you another layer of uh, how that issue is going to go. He also doesn't believe in climate change. So um, that's kind of where he's coming from. Uh, yeah. yeah, and he's, well, he's a former weatherman. Yeah. 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 Um, immigration re reform, Carrie talked about Chris Kobach, who has run for a bevy of uh, elected offices. Um, this is something that is near and dear to his heart. Um, he was close to Trump on this before Trump, Trump kicked him to the side. Uh, longtime immigration foe, ID and citizenship uh, requirements are something that he's really into. Um, he's got some side work where he's been work. Uh, there's a requirement in a small municipality where landlords have to verify citizenship. So that gives you some idea of, of where he's coming. Uh, the Supreme Court selection process is going, oops, election. election reform is another Chris Kobach uh, issue. Kerry brought up that this is going to be drop boxes. This is going to be mail-in ballots. Um, last year, they made some changes to delivery of ballots and limited the number of ballots you can deliver. But there's still work that they can do here, unfortunately. So that will be an issue, and he will be at the front of that. The Supreme Court selection process, uh, this takes us back to the school finance ruling, which they are still ticked about. Um, now we have the new uh, ruling on abortion um, and, and the constitutional amendment that brought the ire of many of the legislators. So um, this is a proposal, again, near and dear to the Senate president's heart. This is where they would change the selection process, make it mer merit-based, and uh, that is uh, obviously to uh, impact the makeup of the court. Right now, it's governor selection out of three um, from a nominating commission. They propose three names and the governor selects one and it's Senate uh, confirmation. So this would remove that process. And then, uh, 
attacks on unions were in Kansas. So um, one thing that they talk about is paycheck protection. You can have dues for unions taken out of your paycheck. They are trying to eliminate that even if you approve or desire to have uh, your dues taken out. So that's an example of one thing that they do as far as unions. Guns, you know, there's not much else we can do in Kansas on guns. Uh, last year, the governor vetoed the 18 year old right to carry. Uh, they were able to override that veto. So um, I think a lot of what we're gonna see this year is gonna be the stand your ground. There's a, there's a lot of opposition to that. This is the duty to, re to retreat prior to use of force, even deadly force to protect yourself or another. And I think that will be an issue that will see a lot of play in uh, federal and state affairs on both sides of the chamber. So here, just to give you uh, some reference uh, for YouTube, everything is all committees and uh, floor action is uh, televised on YouTube. You can just type in KS legislature. I put a picture up there so you know it's the top of the Capitol with the Indian. That uh, will be the picture for uh, what you're looking for. And then also we have the Kansas legislature website, kslegislature.org. That's a tough one. So this is up in the right-hand corner of the uh, kslegislature.org webpage. So you click on audio video, and then you can go down and find the different uh, audio video uh, recordings play of what has gone out. The State House Live and Archive is a calendar, and you can click it lists the different committees, and you can click on the committee, and it will play the uh, recording for you. And you can also watch them live. So with that, um, I appreciate everyone's attention. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk to you about Kansas. And we can take any questions. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is about Medicaid expansion. Um, I saw that with the committee chair changes that have been made, it seems like some key players are opposed to Medicaid expansion. Um, so with those kind of committee leadership changes, do you anticipate that it'll even really get brought up in the committee at all? I suppose it could so that they can rail on it. Um, other than that, it, it's not going to get any positive attention. Um, is there an opportunity in the Care contract um, for nutrition or produce prescription um, type provisions in those contracts? Yeah, I think so. I think it's something that could be brought up to the administration. Uh, my last question is, with the smart committee, I know that last year there was it was really hard to craft what was going on, what committees were doing. There was very little transparency with their process, and I know the legislators were getting upset about that as well. Um, where, like, is there a plan for how the money is going to get spent now? Is that publicly available? Where do people apply for the funding? Decide. <laughs> Um, any information about that would be really helpful. That is the covid.ks.gov. And yes, it was very frustrating. They would uh, either not announce the meetings or announce them the day of or the day before. And uh, that, there were a lot of uh, behind the scenes discussions going on uh, regarding how to spend the money. And they spent a lot of time focusing on those four areas. What the governor wanted was the pots of money for competitive grants, and she ended up getting what she wanted. So the agencies will administer those different pots of money, and they will be competitively granted uh, as far as the $374 million. Some of it will take other machinations, but that's kind of the general uh, way that will be set up. And then there's that $140 million that they shifted into the legislature that there's legislative discretion if they want to use that on something else, but Spark has asked it to be sent back to them so that they can use it for uh, COVID-19 relief. Hello, uh, Irene Galvillo with El Centro, and I appreciate the presentation. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm struck with whether this is the question more than it's a comment, because 
I think what I want everyone in the room to understand uh, is the change in the attorney general. Um, because, you know, you emphasize immigration reform is his background, election reform is his background. Um, it, it, it was so different as far as how he got selected. It wasn't because of the urban, suburban, it was because or lack of name recognition or homeless or whatever happened. Um, but I was one that really thought Sanders had, you know, pushed him out on terms of. So um, when I think about our the concern, uh, I realize we still have to go through the legislature, but the power in, in the position now, as Secretary of State, who is doing things across the country utilizing resources around immigration. Um, my concern, uh, and, and in talking with some of the Wyandotte County delegation last night at their public town hall, is uh, the reference of, of um, going a, uh, a more uh, right, right? That there was a, more of a change than you're presenting here. So with that, and uh, with the thought of a, a po more powerful position, more staff, um, there are things in place in Kansas, not in Missouri, like um, in-state tuition. Um, and um, I, you know, post this to the delegation. Do we worry about? It? We spent four years with a with a Democratic governor who helped he passed you know, way because the repeal was part of his strategy. So that never really came to the table. So for the past four years, we have not had to organize and not had to, um, you know, so so for those of you not aware, in-state tuition has benefited many undocumented students to be able to move forward to school, and many of them are now in the workforce. So, they are our employee, right? They are working, and this this benefits Kansas. Um, I've seen what it's done to our community in the church. So, um, so I guess I'm just wondering, as much as uh, you know, there was no relief last night from the delegation. Um, it, you know, what do we have to think about? Um, you know, as the group, we're gonna we have to we have to organize want to be prepared. But do you see do you see more of the anti-immigration legislation or the fact that it, it's going to pick on things that already exist that could actually be repeated? Yeah. That's probably my question. I don't know. But I need to really No, no, I am first off hiring. Good to see you. Um, I can sit up here and talk about an hour hours about Chris Kobach and the scary things that potentially could happen with him in this new role. Um, I, I'm interested to see what he prioritizes because he has been in so many different places doing so many different things. You know, luck, I don't even want to say luckily. I don't know if he can do everything, you know, just because of all the places he wants to be. I think he's going to have to do a little bit of picking and choosing for a little bit, but I think eventually he will get to all of the things that are on his list. I, I tell people all the time, Chris Kobach is not a dumb guy. He is very smart. He is very intelligent. He knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it and how he is doing it. So I, I could, I mean, again, I could talk about this all day, but I, I do think that we have to be very vigilant and watch. And again, I, I don't think we know yet where exactly he's going to start. I think he has been very open and honest about all the things he wants to do. And I don't think he started even mentioning half of them that are on his mind. Uh, so I, I don't know if I can give you any more hope than the, than the Wyandotte County delegation gave you last night. But I do think that it's somebody that we need to pay very close attention to, not just in the legislature, but, you know, the guy now runs the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, right? He has literally has an investigation unit behind him nowadays, right? Like, and so it's, you know, it's just something that we're going to have to continue to pay attention to, not just, again, what's happening in the legislature, because I think that's one component, but just him in this role and him having a powerful team of attorneys and investigators behind him and then having the ability to do that all day, every day is something that's very concerning. I, I do think that, on the positive note, having a governor and having a legislature that understands how ambitious Chris Kobach is will help us out a little bit. You know, I think that they will pull the reins a little bit, not necessarily 
in our favor, but more just to calm him down for any more than anything. Uh, so I do think that we have a little bit of hope of even his own colleagues are super excited about him or super happy with what he's doing and his trajectory of where he's trying to go with his career. Um, so I do think that'll be a little bit of help for us, but I do think that we, um, we're going to have to be very vigilant. We're going to have to not just watch what he's doing in the legislature, but I expect him to overstep on some local control. And, you know, we didn't talk a little bit about much about this preemption type of deal, but I do think there's a world where we need to talk more about making sure the state legislature is not interfering a lot more with local government and what that looks like in particular. So, yeah, talk about that all day. We can have a whole nother class just about Chris Kobach and what we can do there. So we'll, we'll talk, I'm sure, for sure. Um, Phyllis Harvey Community Capital Fund. I want to add one thing. Chris Kobach was sanctioned to 20 hours of uh, continuing legal education, so he does not know the rule of, ev rules of evidence, and he is the attorney general. So, um, <laughs> um, Phyllis Harvey Community Capital Fund. Um, I think one opportunity with Kansas being a little bit more delayed on their ARPA dollars, hopefully they can learn from some of the mistakes. On the Missouri side, you know, all of the grants required either matching requirements or were reimbursable, which means that they priced out most of the agencies on the smaller scale, which tends to be the ones closest to communities. So I think if there is something that I could, you know, present for help for and, and you guys on the, on the legislative side, if they fall on the like wonky administrative side, but making those grants um, more compliance based, right? So, so grant funding on the front end, but just having really strict report of compliance requirements and eliminating matching grants will really make them more acceptable to more agencies. Yeah, and I know some people have been pushing for that, in particular because of what happens and what has happened in Missouri and some of these other states. You know, again, they have set the bar in so many places so high that a lot of the organizations that are actually on the ground doing the work can't even qualify for them. So it's definitely something that has been in conversation. Again, we will see how how this process all ends up shaking out. But no, it's a very good point, something that we're we're pushing for and watching out on. Sure. This is Scott Engelmeyer with Community Care in Kansas. Uh, Jennifer talked about the MCO procurement, procurement pause legislation last year, which was a pretty thinly veiled attempt to manipulate the process. Uh, the Kansas voters uh, ultimately foiled that. Uh, given that, do you see the legislature trying to intervene in that process, either shape the RFP or shape the process in any way? And if so, how? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, and I, you know, I'm not even sure. Um, the creativity that they often come up with, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, that's something that we will obviously be watching, but interfering with the process, they will definitely try to mold the RFP um, with a lot of the uh, ideas that they want. I think there will be a lot of uh, current MCO influence, um, so, yeah, I really am not sure what they're going to come up with. Do you have a couple of things that um, I wanted to mention? One, uh, with regard to Medicaid expansion and given the outlook on uh, Medicaid expansion, Health Forward has been a longtime funder of Alliance for Healthy Kansas, uh, co funding with some of the other foundations in Kansas that are focused on access to health. And given the grim outlook, uh, the members of the Alliance, the work of the Alliance, is we're shifting a bit, continue focusing on Medicaid expansion, but also to incorporate some things that are somewhat Medicaid expansion adjacent. Uh, then we'll also go toward increasing access and equity, uh, reducing those uh, disparities, uh, but wanting to sort of um, uh, add some additional opportunities uh, that are more likely uh, to our scope of work so that we're continuing to advance these forward and provide greater access for folks. Another thing uh, to mention, uh, housing related, number one, acknowledge one of our board members who's in the room, I forgot to mention, Jeff Jolly. Another one of our very well informed uh, and, and uh, board members in addition to Irene. Uh, last year, there was a bill, uh, a couple of bills introduced. One that was uh, Life Tech Life focused on uh, increasing uh, the availability of affordable housing in rural. Can you all hear me? Uh, that passed. There was another introduced that would have made uh, the Life Tech program available in the non didn't pass. My, re my reflection is correct. Uh, so we are also monitoring housing in Kansas, also Missouri state level, local level. Um, 
Jay Carry on anything to add to the add of Jeff that as well. That might have been it. There wasn't a whole lot of housing activity yeah. that you might imagine. Any other questions? Going once. Okay. Well, uh, I, yeah, I just want to pop up and say I, I see a lot of our good friends in the room. I just want to say thank you guys for all, one for being here, but thank you guys for all the work you're doing. I know we're going back into legislative session in a couple of days. So excited to see you guys again. Again, it's like the first day of school. You can see all your friends again. So I'm excited to see you guys. I'm excited for thank you. Just want to say thank you guys for everything you guys are all out there doing as well. It makes our life just a little bit easier. Thank you. We moved on to the next part of our programming today, uh, the Missouri Legislative Outlook. Uh, with us today, we have two guests. Uh, we have Katie Gamble with Gamble and Schlemeyer and uh, Sammy Panetari from uh, Panetari uh, Pol Pol Public Affairs. Um, and they'll be doing the sort of same, uh, you know, song and dance that we had with Kansas, but this time on the Missouri side. Uh, Again, it's going to be about an hour. Uh, they'll present for probably 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll do uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Sam Sammy. Are you going to go first or is, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Since we're doing, since we're doing the webcast, you got to like, stay right here. Be right I need to listen to this. You guys are in charge. You're yeah. This You're told there's like 12 vegetarians, right? Yeah. In the group, and we may have a vegetarian, but and they're going to come here and tell us. The some people think it's an extra salad, and we're like, oh, there's like some people that need to get a vegetarian. Can you make an announcement to the vegetarian and let us know? And we'd like them to stay in the meal for people and get them to talk to Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Well, just a quick announcement. Uh, if you did not uh, indicate that you're a vegan or vegetarian, just try and not eat one of those salads because those are for the people who indicated uh, uh, that. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you if you are vegan or vegetarian, please let let them know and they'll uh, they'll give you the salad. Okay. Sam. Good. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you all. Uh, my name is Sam Panateri. I am the principal of Panateri Public Affairs and a partner at State Fine Strategies Lobbying Firm. I'm going to be joined by my partner. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to be joined by um, my partner, Katie Gamble, and Lynch Meyer very shortly. Um, but it's good to be with you all, see a lot of familiar faces, always appreciate the opportunity to be here, um, and always appreciate y'all's engagement in, in the process and um, both, both sides of the state line. So thank you for being here and being engaged in all of this. Um, I'm going to kind of kick off in the same format that the Kansas folks did, um, kind of giving you a overview of the landscape, the environment in Missouri right now. Um, we, uh, you know, Jeff City, compared to Congress right now, looks functional, so that's a, <laughs> a, a, a new thing. Um, we don't know how long it'll last, um, but we are kind of um, learning right now as the session kicks off. It kicked off yesterday, no, Wednesday. Um, ceremonial um, leadership made speeches. We don't have committees um, announced, assignments, things like that, but Let's start, let's back up a little bit and talk about um, where we're at in Missouri. Um, so obviously this past election cycle um, was a midterm, as Carrie pointed out earlier. We had a US Senate race on the ballot. Attorney General Schmidt um, won that race. So Governor Parson recently appointed um, uh, Andrew Bailey as general counsel to succeed Eric Schmidt as an interim attorney general uh, for the next two years. So that's a big statewide obvious office, obviously, um, that has some impact on, on things going on in the state. The other one is Scott Fitzpatrick, who was treasurer in Missouri, 
um, ran for the office of auditor. He was elected and um, Governor Parson made another appointment, his sixth statewide appointment, which is pretty historic um, for a gentleman named Vivek Malik, um, who is a gentleman from Southeast Missouri State who has not held elected office, um, but has been involved. I believe he's on the board of curators for Southeast Missouri State. So he's relatively unknown, but um, I think we'll be um, getting to know him over the next couple of years. Missouri legislature, that's kind of the, the main thing that I want to talk to you about the environment. A lot like Kansas, some things changed, people turned over. Um, there's a lot of new members. Uh, we have term limits in Missouri. So we have about a roughly a third of the folks in the General Assembly, which is made up of 197 members who are new um, in their positions, which is always a an interesting issue and challenge to educate folks um, on, on all the issues in a, in a finite amount of time during the legislative session. So um, roughly, um, just like in Kansas, there was no red wave. In fact, um, three Democrats picked up seats. Uh, Democrats picked up three seats in the Missouri House. However, there's still a supermajority. Um, so the Republican Party is in the supermajority in the House. Um, Senate, likewise, the numbers stayed exactly the same. We have 24 Republicans and 10 Democrats in the Senate. Um, many of those members have come over from the House. Again, with term limits, you see their terms expire and run for higher office. So interestingly, on the Senate, uh, while the numbers stayed the same, it's uh, arguable that it got more conservative. Um, there had been kind of a faction within the majority party in the Senate known as the Conservative Caucus. It has been disbanded, um, they say, but there's been more members elected um, that we would kind of classify in the conservative camp versus more the traditional Chamber of Commerce type Republican camp. So that's an interesting facet to just keep your eye on. Um, in the House, um, leadership elections, um, um, in the House, um, which has generally been the more uh, conservative body, um, we actually had leadership elections that um, uh, propelled uh, Majority Floor Leader Dean Plocker to now the Speaker. Uh, his office, and also we have uh, Dr. John Patterson from Lee Summit, who uh, was elected by his colleagues to serve as majority, majority floor leader. I note this one particularly, Dr. John Patterson from our area, that's significant. Um, he's the only member from our region who is at the leadership table um, in the majority party in either chamber. So, um, and then on the Senate side, uh, the majority floor leader, Caleb Rowden, um, was elected by his peers to become the president pro tem. Um, that's significant because he is in charge of shaping the committees and assigning committee chairmanships. Um, he would be probably classified in the traditional Chamber of Commerce Republican category. And then um, Cindy O'Loughlin, a uh, senator from Northeast Missouri, uh, coming into her second term, was elected as the new majority floor leader. And she had been a member of the conservative caucus, which again has been disbanded, but uh, maybe kind of categorize her in that kind of vein of uh, the party. So that's where at. you see um, the leadership here. Um, we also have, I wanna point out, we have Senate uh, Minority Leader John Rizzo, who remains in that position, also from the area, just in the uh, minority party. So that's significant. Um, other than that, on the on the ballot, so it's, it's new new players, new faces, but not a lot of the dynamics change there necessarily. The only other thing really significant um, for this group that, that to point out that passed on the ballot, which you're all aware of, is the um, recreational marijuana uh, ballot initiative. Um, and we'll get to some of the legislative priorities here in a bit which will include initiative petition reform and how that kind of factors into that equation. Um, 
So leadership priorities, um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. We're going to kind of, you know, kind of give you the 30,000 foot view, and then Katie's going to talk about how some of this fits in with the health forward policy agenda, and then so we have plenty of time for questions. But leadership um, has an ambitious agenda, primarily because last session it was such a cluster, cluster for lack of a better word. Um, they were bogged down with congressional maps, which um, really sucked the oxygen out of the um, uh, General Assembly for most of the session. So a lot of these uh, priorities are kind of um, things that have come back um, um, and they have more um, legislative behind them, you know, whether it's the folks who are sponsoring these initiatives or just the fact that they're, they've risen up to the priority um, level. And again, just to reiterate, you all know that it's a finite amount of time. So all these priorities can't get done, right? So it's a matter of them prioritizing their priorities. And so just to name a few, um, and we can elaborate on them later, but uh, the President Pro Tem, Caleb Rowden, and Speaker Plocker made speeches the uh, first day of session. Um, not a lot of surprises, um, but I will say um, one thing that was encouraging um, was uh, President Pro Tem Rowden talking about um, the extension of postpartum Medicaid coverage. Um, again, it was something that was discussed on the floor last year um, and didn't, uh, didn't uh, win a majority. In fact, it got stalled there. On the other side of the, of the building, um, again, Dr. John Patterson, the majority floor leader in the House, has sponsored this legislation. So we see this as kind of an encouraging sign that um, both parties are going to be on board with this. Doesn't mean it's easier. It's going to necessarily get done, but it's something that they're certainly going to spend that valuable time to work towards and craft something to get postpartum Medicaid coverage. Um, other issues, some of these, you know, may or may not be important to you, but I want to just kind of let you know about them since they will be taking up some time in the legislature. Sports wagering, um, this is something the legislature's tried for a few years and has been unsuccessful um, with the contiguous states around Missouri passing it, um, primarily Illinois and Kansas. It's kind of risen even further to the top um, of that issue. I just want to give you a little background real quick on just why that hasn't passed, just so you're kind of aware of the dynamics and the process in Missouri. Um, so sports wagering, online gambling has been very popular and it would probably pass easily if it were to get a vote. Um, with the liberal amendment process, there's a contingent in Missouri that wants to um, legalize what are called VLTs, video lottery machines. So this would essentially expand gambling outside of um, the riverboat casinos and online on your phone. So it would essentially put you know, machines in gas stations, truck stops, fraternal uh, organizations, things like that. That issue has not really had the support um, that online wagering has yet it's kind of the only vehicle that those folks see as a way to legalize this. So look for that to be a recurring issue over the session. Um, uh, Senator Rowden, Speaker Plocker, Senator Rizzo have all said they want to get this done this year. So I do believe they'll work towards a compromise. How that looks, we don't know yet, but it will take a considerable amount of time, energy, and political capital to kind of get through the session on that. And there's and there's questions about um, you know where that money is going to go to what what portions should go to education versus veterans versus you know wherever yeah. so um, something to stay tuned uh, on um, education um, last <coughs> session they were able to pass um, some reforms they have come back and wanted to uh, make this a big priority again um, between teacher pay. Um, and then, of course, as mentioned in Kansas, uh, curriculum restrictions, prohibitions, you know, think CRT, um, things like that. So, and then the other one, of course, that's really is school choice, charter schools. Um, that issue will probably come to the forefront. And I say that, especially uh, former 
chair of the education committee, Cindy O'Laughlin, has now risen to the majority floor leader. And we know that that's one of her priorities and something that she will probably spend considerable time on or want to spend considerable time on the floor. So it's kind of the education vein. Um, child care. Um, this is something that's encouraging as well. Um, Lieutenant Governor Kehoe has organized a task force to look into um, what we can do um, to help with child care. Um, the narrative has shifted on this, which is very fortunate, to make it more and highlight that this is a workforce issue, correct? And Governor Parson has kind of tried to make his legacy around workforce development and, you know, just doing what he can for the workforce. So with Governor Kehoe's leadership um, uh, and, and, and many, even including the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and others, there's going to be a focus on child care. What exactly that looks like right now is uncertain. The governor is going to give his state of the state on January 18th. We anticipate more than legislative um, action. There being budget, budgetary action on this. That's, you know, in the form of tax credits or grants or, um, you know, obviously programming and things like that um, will be, you know, the devil will be in the details on that, but we do anticipate a package that the governor presents um, on January 18th to uh, come available so that we can see kind of what, what his idea is on his first shot at this. Um, we have a lot of money in the budget, which Katie's gonna talk about kind of the budget highlights, um, but folks are kind of saying this, this is the year to do it, and this is the year to get engaged in it. It's obviously highlighted the problems with it during COVID particularly and, and ongoing. And, and I think businesses are continuing to hear uh, about it and raising it to the level uh, of, of trying to get something done in this session. Um, IP reform, initiative petition reform, um, you know, you're all aware, obviously, um, uh, thank goodness we had that ability to do that for Medicaid expansion um, after, you know, beating our heads against the wall in the legislature over the years on trying to get that done. Um, most recently, we talked about uh, recreational marijuana passing, um, and then, of course, minimum wage a, a few years ago was something. These things all were blocked by the majority parties in the legislature. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of a contingent growing where they don't want to be circumvented right around their around their process. Um, so there's an effort to try to reform um, the initiative petition process in order to, um, you know, I, I think it's um, fair to say, make it more cumbersome, make it more difficult to to get things on the ballot and pass things on the ballot too. So um, we'll, we'll see if they wanna raise the threshold um, to pass something or how they wanna construct it. Um, but the House made it a big priority last year. They advanced it to the Senate. The Senate did not um, take it up um, for a number of reasons, but this year we expect and anticipate a renewed push on initiative petition reform. Um, Again, we will see, just like Kansas, um, efforts to um, prohibit uh, transgender athletics. Um, and I, I don't see that issue. Um, in fact, there were several senators that filed bills um, on this issue. And so I do see this issue getting um, floor time. I don't know that there's a consensus on how to do it or what to do it, because you see so many different proposals. But I definitely think this is something that will take uh, take time during the legislative session. Um, and finally, and kind of broadly, economic development. Um, there's, you know, I saw one slide that said we have a lot of money, too much money. I, I don't think we have too much money in this area right now. We are sitting on a big budget surplus. Lots of ideas on how to spend that, of course. Um, but one of the big ones, obviously, broadband infrastructure. Um, and so we're going to look for that. We also have several proposals um, uh, in the economic development vein uh, to uh, use some of that surplus money to uh, buy better road infrastructure. I-7 has been considered. 
a lot of economic development things will also be centered around, especially for our area, um, preparation for the World Cup. Um, you know, there's a huge um, uh, area of folks that will travel from St. Louis, from Iowa, from Kansas, Colorado, um, to come to games here. And so there's a lot of uh, consideration and conversation around making sure that we're prepared um, with adequate uh, roads um, for that. Um, so look for some of those things to be talked about. Um, there will probably be other economic development initiatives, tax credits conversation, whether it's reform or new tax credits um, to try to incentivize business and, and, and grow business here. So that's a lot in, in a little time and kind of a 30,000 foot view. So if you have any questions about that, happy to answer them. I'm gonna kind of flip it over to Katie here to kind of expand on uh, the budget. Hi, first just wanna say thanks for coming and listening to us during lunch. Um, I'm Katie Gamble, as Sam mentioned, uh, and really appreciate how long we've been working with Health Forward, I think for six and a half, seven years, as long as I've been doing this. So um, we really appreciate the partnership. So I want to start by saying that uh, and then talk about the budget before heading into how all of this relates to what we're seeing as far as bills being filed uh, and how it goes back to the Health Forward agenda because money is always important. And so it's good we talk about that first before we start talking about policy. Uh, so as Sam mentioned, we have $6 billion supposedly uh, in the bank in Missouri. And even though that looks like a large number, there are differing opinions on how much of that we can really spend and on what. And so meetings I've had with the governor's office, they've been really hesitant to uh, spend a lot of general revenue dollars uh, from the state because they're anticipating, as I think a lot of people are, that the economy may change. And so they, we have to have a balanced budget in Missouri, and they want to make sure that they're not overspending. So you may see these headlines about $6 billion. You may also see headlines about the state kind of tampering down on their spending all at the same time. So it's an interesting time to be working in Missouri, uh, as always. And, you know, we're going to see this budget. The governor's going to probably release his priorities for the budget when he does the state of the state on January 18th. It'll then move through the legislative process. I'll touch on it a little bit later, but there's all this infrastructure money coming down. And the challenge Missouri has is that we're not sure we're gonna know how much money we have uh, this session or in time to get it through the budget this year. So you could see uh, Missouri not actually moving very far on their infrastructure dollars just yet because we don't know how much exactly we're getting from the feds. We know it's probably gonna be a lot of money, especially in the broadband realm, uh, but we just don't have those numbers. Again, that could change, you never know. Um, but given everything that's currently happening at the federal level, I'm probably not optimistic <laughs> that things are gonna be moving faster. Um, I think too, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but tax cut, the, so the legislature came in for a special session and they cut taxes. And as Sam mentioned, they have talked about their priorities. And when Speaker Plocker spoke about his in the House this week, he talked about potentially wanting to cut more taxes, um, which is always a little concerning, especially when we don't know what the economy is going to look like. And I think it would probably be more around corporate money because they did an individual income tax cut uh, for a special session in September. And there was discussion about corporate. There was not really an interest in doing it. And then Plocker comes out this week and says, I think we should be giving more money back to the taxpayers. And so what is that going to look like? Uh, I haven't seen a ton of specific legislation regarding what that plan would be. So we'll see how much of that is just his idea and him saying what he wants versus actual action. But I do think that that's something that we're going to have to keep in mind because now, as we have more tax cuts, it means less money that the state can spend uh, on some things that are good, uh, which I'm going to talk about when we when I go through the agenda. So that's kind of broadly where we are with budget. Uh, we have a budget chair in the House because uh, Republican uh, Representative Cody Smith has been the budget chair. He will remain the budget chair. The House has subcommittees on appropriations that deal with each of the specific like departments. And previously, they kind of act as 
provide, they provide recommendations to the full budget committee. Uh, the rules that were published this week, which are currently temporary, but will probably go into effect on Wednesday, would give a little bit more authority to those sub uh, committee chairs. And so as we finally get some chairs named next week, it's going to be more important, um, not that it wasn't important to talk with them before, because it was, but they're going to be able to actually make changes to their budget in their committees. And so, you know, it's going to be vital that we continue to meet with those uh, chairs as they are announced as well. So a little bit different structure in the House than we've had recently. And then on the Senate side, we anticipate Senator Lincoln Huff becoming the appropriations chair. I can't, was that official last week? No, yeah, I don't, yeah. he will be um, if he's not officially yeah. yet. The Senate has probably, they passed their rules. They made some changes to their committees. They'll probably announce their committee chairs mid next week. Um, the House will probably do it later next week. Um, so we won't see a lot of like active committee hearings until, you know, probably following two weeks from now. So that's the least. I want to add one thing real quick um, before Katie gets into um, how this kind of fits in with health board priorities. Um, it is significant to point out that Senator Lincoln Huff from Springfield, who was just recently reelected, will be appointed as um, the appropriations chair of the Senate. Um, Y'all remember we've had some struggles with Medicaid expansion, right, in the Missouri legislature over the years. Um, Lincoln, um, a member of the majority party, um, has been a, a very good ally uh, with Medicaid expansion. So this is a, a new thing. He, in fact, was, I'd say, primarily responsible for stopping the effort to undo Medicaid expansion last year by putting it back on the ballot. So it's, you know, again, the Senate may have gotten more conservative, but with the election of Caleb Rowden to pro tem, putting Lincoln Huff from Springfield as the appropriations chair, which whether it's official yet or not, it will be, he, he I mean, it's, it's assumed he, um, he will be a good ally in, you know, um, stopping some of the, any, if there are any efforts to um, try to peel back anything that we've done as far as Medicaid expansion. So just wanted to highlight that. So I'm gonna run through the health forward priorities based on the four categories that uh, McLean highlighted earlier, uh, just so we can kind of <laughs> talk about them in like in groups, because I think that makes it easier to think about these issues. So we'll start with people and that's first, as Sam mentioned earlier, the extension of benefits for moms on Medicaid. Uh, currently, it's like six weeks uh, after giving birth. And so the bill that is proposed and that Senator Rowden talked about in his opening day speech is the first priority that he talked about. Um, it's, uh, it would extend uh, coverage for a year. We're really hopeful. I'm not usually that hopeful, <laughs> um, but I'm really hopeful this year on that piece because it was really close last year and the senator that blocked it is gone. And I think that there's some in really good, interesting stakeholders. So um, meaning that some, some groups that maybe aren't normally on the same side are on the same side of this issue. And so really hopeful that that's something that we get done this year. Um, also under people, we're always watching access to SNAP benefits. We see a variety of different things that, you know, may make it more difficult or may kick a parent off SNAP, which is, doesn't help their kid because if there's less food in the household, there's less food in the household. Um, you know, it, there are a lot of policy initiatives that have been filed. We haven't seen as many filed yet this year, but in general, that try to use SNAP benefits as a stick, which is just not great. So we, we watch those very carefully. Um, as Sam said, Medicaid expansion and anything that would try to change the way that um, the program's currently working uh, and telehealth, those are all things that I think we're gonna see this year under people, I guess not exactly the Medicaid expansion, hopefully. Um, I think that issue is fairly put to rest, but I am hesitant to even say that out loud. Um, <laughs> So hopefully it's all good things uh, with like the extension of benefits and, and not the negative things, but we'll, we'll be there tracking and watching because you never know. Uh, I should also add that we've already seen a thousand bills. So we started session on Wednesday, pre-filing started in December and there have already, already been a thousand bills filed. Um, so there's a lot of legislation that we're sifting through. Um, so if you have any questions on things, just shout it out because I'm just 
talking fast and highlighting a couple of the, the primary things that I see. Um, Sam covered initiative petition reform. Rowden talked about it in his opening day speech. I've heard from legislators that it's a priority of his and that they're specifically looking at the threshold on the vote and increasing it. So that is something of concern. Um, did I say this is under power? This is under power. Um, also, we always follow all the voting rights bills. Um, not so great last year. The legislature did pass uh, the voter ID bill, which included you know, some provision, well, a lot of provisions that are not great. Uh, and then it did include the uh, no excuse uh, vote early voting. So that was kind of the only positive in that. But I think for now that issue is probably put to rest because they did something last year. Uh, so I think that's why they're gonna turn to the IP reform. And then last under power, just public health authority specifically came to light after COVID. I think that issue right now probably too is a little quieter than we've seen the last couple of years, but we're always watching um, the ability of public health to do their job and making sure that they still do that. Um, under place, we're looking at um, you know, the ability to, uh, try to remember exactly the word, the moratorium on it, yeah, okay. So there's a couple bills that um, would, they deal with the moratorium on eviction specifically, you see Republicans after COVID when they said, hey, you can't evict anybody. They're not big fans of that concept. And so they wanna supersede the ability uh, of anybody to say that, hey, you know, as a, you know, you can't evict any tenants. Um, that's not great. We saw it last year, it didn't move very far. I don't know this year, it, it could. Um, I think it's probably not like high on the list, but it's definitely something they're talking about. We can see it added to another bill. So we have to be very mindful of that. Uh, on a positive note, I think we're potentially gonna see some money I've been hearing in the budget for healthcare workforce. Uh, so specifically like public health officials workforce money. Um, so we need to keep an eye on that and how the department plans to use it and if the governor is actually going to put the money in, uh, but it's something to keep in mind. And then um, we're always following my tax, so low income housing tax credit under housing. And then I think one of the biggest things right now is the broadband money. It's a big issue for everybody. Um, you know, rural, urban, uh, the state's getting a lot of money under both the BEAD and the digital equity money from the federal infrastructure bill. They had listening sessions all fall and they put forth their proposal to like, draw down the state's funds. And so we're just waiting to see how much money the state gets before they can put a full plan together. And that goes back to you know my comment earlier about we may not know what all uh, we're gonna have in time to appropriate it uh, before the end of May. And so you know, do they come back in a special session? Probably not. Are we not gonna get that money appropriated till next year? You know, does that make it a tight turnaround for getting the dollars out? Those are all things that they're going to be talking about this session. Uh, and then lastly, platform. We've been working with Senator Washington on a disaggregated public health data legislation. Um, we've had conversations with uh, legislators and stakeholders, and this is the third year that we've been working on this bill, um, but really trying to get good data because you can't make policy decisions if you don't have the information you need to make those decisions. Um, that's a lot. I was rambling, I apologize. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'll let Sam uh, touch on anything else that I may have missed uh, and then have any other questions. I think, I think we did cover quite a bit. And this is again, as Katie pointed out, this is what we know right now. There's been a thousand pieces of legislation filed up to this point. Um, Typically in a session, there's about 2,000. So there could be an emerging issue that we're not aware of at this point that of course we'll make you aware of through um, our reporting to um, McLean and, and Health Board um, to put on your radar. But um, that we covered quite a bit there in a little amount of time. Um, again, there's so many moving pieces right now with both people um, and, and committees and, and legislative priorities and again, some of these things could shift depending on the governor's um, budget recommendation um, when we uh, learn about that at the state of the state. So um, this is just kind of a preview of a preview and we just wanna be um, respectful and, and if anyone has any questions, um, we're happy to, to try to answer those. And,
again, we appreciate working with you all. Absolutely, we'll do some Q and A now. energy around short-term uh, housing rentals, um, and I know this impacts folks in Branson and like their local folks not being able to access housing because of short-term rental challenges. So I'm curious if there's any conversation about that. Yeah, um, I can speak to that. That issue is something. And <coughs> so I represent the city of Kansas City. Um, we obviously have that as a priority. That's a big neighborhood issue right now. Um, there's been an audit recently in Kansas City talking about the missed revenue um, from not having a, a short-term a, a, a short-term rental policy that, that acts as parity with uh, hotel and lodging um, taxing um, structure. Um, so there will be a, a renewed conversation on that. This was something that was talked about and discussed last um, in 2019, I believe, and it was. Uh, Put forward by a representative from Kansas City area who's in uh, who's in the restaurant business. Um, one of the reasons why this is going to be propelled again, at least from our region, is obviously the anticipation of FIFA uh, NFL draft and FIFA coming here. Um, on top of the neighborhood concerns, of course, we want to capture that revenue and make sure that there's adequate um, resources to you know regulate these things, right? So a regulated industries can't handle um, what's going on right now. You mentioned Branson, that has been um, kind of the uh, contingent that has been opposed to um, any changes in, in short-term rental policy, um, structure, taxation structure, and any reforms. Um, I will tell you um, that I don't anticipate that succeeding. Like, I don't think that the, the realtors organization and the folks that represent those groups will um, you know, fall away from their opposition, but I do think there will be an effort to try to work with them in partnership with the hotel industry to try to get some parity on short-term rentals. And there may be an effort to try to make that um, exclusively apply to our area versus a statewide platform. So that's kind of a to be continued, but good question. That is an issue that's gonna be um, discussed. Hi, hello, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Class of nice to be in the space as well. Um, my question really is just trying to get your sense of the pulse of some of the legislation with regards to trans student athletes um, and the rejection of care bills in particular, because I know that the um, Senate Majority Leader Pro Tem now has said trans athletics is a big deal, a big priority, but I haven't heard much about the refusing care to trans students or to trans kids. I'm trying to, what is the pulse of that? I, that focus? Yeah, I do think the focus, it's, it's on both. I think they're currently focusing more on athletes and care. We did see more care bills this year than we've seen in the past. Uh, of concern, um, but I think if one of them, it, it sounds like from the Republicans at this particular point in time, that that is gonna be a big focus of theirs among a lot of other interesting things. I think if I had to pull out my crystal ball, that the athlete piece is the piece that they're going to focus on more uh, than the care piece, but you never know. Wholeheartedly agree with what Katie said. Um, they're they're separate until they're not, and it could cause um, a problem with them being combined. But I will say that there seems to be a growing consensus on the athletic piece, the therapy piece, the um, care piece is is very unsettled right now, and hasn't been exhaust. It hasn't been discussed a, a, a ton. So I think that's more of a new one that has a longer shot. Yeah, I think they're going to focus too on there's so many different versions of the athletic piece that I, th I think the focus is going to be on figuring out what version they want to move forward with. Is it K through 12? Is it, you know, all levels of education? Good question. I have a couple questions about um, kind of food security things. Um, is there much legislation that could come out of the work of the governor's? task force 
um, on food security. And then also, um, there's been some different bills to eliminate the remainder of the state food sales tax um, that have different funding mechanisms. So that lost revenue doesn't impact um, public schools. Um, so what do you what do you hear about the the food security tax force and any policy coming out of that? And then also um, anything about movement on eliminating the remainder of the I'll start with the second piece um, because there was a discussion last year about eliminating um, pieces of the food tax. Uh, it actually got a really bad amendment that tied it to WIC instead um, of SNAP, which would have actually increased food taxes. Um, that's not the intent, but they didn't really know what was what they were doing. Um, so uh, I do think right there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I do think that uh, Mary Elizabeth Coleman, uh, now Senator, uh, carried the food tax bill in the House. She's now in the Senate. So that could get, you know, we could see a, a bigger push there. What's interesting is there are also um, bill, a lot of bills regarding re the removal of taxes on like feminine hygiene products, and diapers, and those types of things. And so I could see them all combined together. Uh, the only time in the challenge is that they're going to have a large fiscal note. And so um, it would be great if we were going to look at cutting taxes, maybe uh, something like that instead. But I think the concern is, especially from you know the budgetary and the appropriation chairs, what's the hit on that to the budget? Um, and then regarding the task force, um, I think there are probably some pieces that um, they're going to get filed in regards to that. I don't know any of the specifics. Um, but I have a colleague who works really closely with that. Um, we also um, work with YMCA's and they care a lot about food security. So um, I'm happy to touch base with you after and I'm, my, she's gonna know more. So I can help you out there. Unless Sam. No, I think it remains to be seen. And you know, that may be something that's touched on in the, in the governor's speech, um, uh, but whether it is accompanied with legislative action, it's, it's probably too early to tell, but we can definitely follow up and report back. Just a quick comment. You know, we talk about health in, in Missouri specifically, and I know this is uh, maybe not the primary. We talk maybe more about uh, this would be in the vein of criminal justice, but we're a state that is still executing people. Uh, Tuesday night, cause of death on the death certificate, legal homicide. That's a health issue. Uh, it's uh, lots of issues, but just kind of wanted to throw that reminder out. Another one is scheduled. We killed in December. Lots of racism there. Uh, his last statement was, uh, put the death because of grace of, in the circuit. So just a reminder. Anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Or... Anything being discussed uh, about youth during summer, you know, uh, when they're in school, uh, about uh, workforce uh, employment skills, training, and things like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's many proposals and, and programs that are often um, discussed and advocated for through the budget process is where I would primarily see that. Um, Senator Barbara Ann Washington has been a champion to try to get funding in the budget for youth programming, um, represent the Kansas City Urban uh, Youth Academy um, as one example of uh, funding that goes towards programming for um, youth in, in those type of programs. Um, there's many others um, statewide, um, well, not statewide programs, but different programs around the state. Um, I don't think there's been any global discussion of, of things like that, um, but I think it's something that individual members from communities uh, like to try to address in their own way with partnerships they may have in their own districts with certain organizations. So is that kind of what you're thinking yeah. about? Can okay. you tell me again, what was the name of the organization that you said they talked about? Um, so, for example, Senator Barbara Ann Washington has uh, supported and, and provided funding for the Kansas City Urban Youth Academy. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Among others, too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, my question is regarding integration, not just here at Kansas City, but in St. Louis, all across the state. The 
legal action that have taken place regarding the homeless. Will that be revisited? Not quite sure. Can you elaborate on what policy? The laws that have been made, laws that were made into laws basically. Um, there's that new cover of that. And so your, is your question, are they going to revisit it, yeah. maybe the policy? I think there will be an effort to. I do not think that I would not be optimistic about that because it's so new and implemented. It was sponsored by Senator Thompson Rader, I mm -hmm. believe, mm -hmm. while she carried it in the Senate. Yeah. Um, Curtis, I didn't carry it in the House. The Senate. Yeah, and so the House sponsor is now in the Senate. The senator who carried it um, has, I know that there's been discussions with her about some of the potential, um, you know, unintended consequences of it. Um, I don't think there's probably an impetus to revisit it and change it this session. Um, but I think that as those con conversations continue, um, there may be more folks in the legislature that are willing to, you know, make that their priority to try to fix some of those issues. Um, I think they also kind of lean back on, you know, um, let this play out. It hasn't, you know, really, um, you know, that they think that it's still, there's a, a, a chance that the positive impacts of the bill are, you know, um, you know, going to be over, you know, over the course of the next couple of years, something that um, in their view um, works. But as far as them spending time during session to, it's very rare when you have a piece of legislation passed to have it you know, repealed or reformed the immediate year after is, is, is kind of my guess. So um, specific provisions in it that you, you know, may or may not want to address. Um, maybe they could do in a piecemeal fashion over the course of the next couple of years. Hey, Sammy, uh, quick hey, question Jeff. on housing in particular. So in, in Kansas, we did see over the last few years, some coalitions uh, emerge between rural and urban interests around housing in particular. Um, they did a statewide needs assessment I was talking to our lieutenant governor a little bit about the fact that we have a surplus and he's like, well, let's go talk to the governor. Who knows what he's going to do with it? Um, I, I'm interested in, do you see opportunities? Many people don't uh, realize, like, some of our most housing cost burden individuals actually live in rural Missouri, mm -hmm. particularly south of the Ozark. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes we see these issues, I think more in Missouri, where it's almost like an urban rural perception of divide on issues that actually are impacting both communities. Um, do you see opportunities for some collaborative efforts across the state on any of the kind of people, place, power, platform, you know, priorities for the first board? I do, and I think, that issue has arisen after a lot of the commonalities have been discovered in food insecurity, right? In rural and urban areas. So I think housing is now something that's kind of on the radar that we need to come together and, and, and work on. Do you have anything to add on, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think housing, I think we're gonna see it, you know, the issues we're seeing it in include the extension of, you know, healthcare benefits for moms, um, there, was, there was something else that Ron talked about. He made the comment on the floor, which is, I think, kind of a big deal that says like, hey, if we're going to be pro-life as Republicans, we need to be pro-life more than just in saying that we are. And so there are several policies. I'm going to be interested to see the actual details in them, uh, but including the extension of coverage. Also talked about, um, you know, if people are working, you know, they're, I don't want to use the word bettering themselves, it's not the right word, uh, but you know, if they if you start to make strides where you start to make more money, but then you're cut off from your benefits, and then all of a sudden it doesn't help that you're making more money because you're losing all your benefits. And he specifically mentioned wanting to address that problem, uh, so the cliff effect, which I thought was really interesting. And again, I want to see the 
devil's in the details. And so I want to see what that looks like exactly. Um, but I think on some pieces like that in regards to healthcare more than housing, even we may see um, you know, that the issues that we're seeing in rural Missouri are the same issues that we're seeing urban. They look a little different, but there's still similar challenges. I think we have uh, one thing to, yeah, yeah, one plus McLean. So we got, uh, we'll have McLean do a little chat here and then we'll do one more question. Just to piggyback off of some of what was already said on that um, as you know, Jeff, we uh, really try to identify issues where there's a little likely to be, or hopefully, should be some bipartisan support given. The issue might present a little bit differently in a rural area versus an urban area, but it's the same issue. It doesn't have to be an fault either because it's an economic issue or a, a sort of racial disparity sort of issue. Uh, other examples would be like access to community health workers, access to telehealth, telemedicine, while, you know, in a rural area, it could be because there's no broadband in the community. Uh, it could also be that they don't have. Uh, access to the equipment because of the portability issue. Um, but whether urban or rural, um, having access to telemedicine is a huge convenience, uh, increases access to specialists outside of you know the direct proximity. And so um, it's kind of by design that we look for issues that will both improve rural communities and urban communities. And I would just say it's imperative that we talk to the rural legislators legislators. Um, you know, Missouri is 197 members, so we're like the fourth largest legislature in the country for some reason, probably to have a disproportionate impact from rural legislators in the process, right? So it's imperative that we educate and commun communicate with them on, you know, how these things affect their community, so. I, I have a question. Um, about the bill you mentioned about the public health data, um, the impact of some data, can you give a little bit more detail about that if you're leaving? Second. Oh, McClain. McClain, you <laughs> Yeah, so um, in previous and even the current iteration, because we're at our third stab at it, uh, the bill would require a uniform collection and reporting out of uh, public health data by race, ethnicity, nationality, language, zip code. Um, and uh, we are hopeful to see some movement with the bill this year. Um, there are some hospital systems and clinics that voluntarily collect and report out that data, which is great, but because it's only done so, it's hard to then you know, aggregate and evaluate and, and really learn from it and then apply it. Uh, so it's really that uniformity that we're, we're pushing as well as the mandate. Um, we've had conversations with the Great Hospital Association, going to engage other elected stakeholders and impact parties, hoping that we can kind of coalesce around this issue and find sort of the pain points, work through those, and then sort of work progressively towards something that would be workable for a variety of people, but we're still sort of in the early stages, but if there are interested parties, Definitely. All right, um, Barry, anything really pressing? Let's uh, give uh, Sammy and Katie a. Um, all right, uh, we're, we're uh, going to take another little break here. We're. we're um, all right, uh, we're going to bring it back home here for the final stretch, the final uh, 90 minutes here. Um, before uh, we, we get into this part, I did wanna say, we, we wanted to make sure that if everything bombed today, we, at, at least everyone would be well-fed. Uh, so we do have snacks coming later. So I hope you left some room from the taco bar. I believe it's popcorn and churros. So, um, so hang around. Uh, and oh, okay, so I think we're about at the time. Um, I do want to uh, introduce our next virtual guest, uh, Leslie Barnes, who is, oh, we have one question in the chat. Um, what is it, what's it about? Uh, 
Um, okay. Uh, yes, we have Leslie Barnes, Senior Counsel from Boulder Advocacy. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're trying to do more as a, a, a funder, a community member, a partner, um, and, and trying to get us all to row in the same direction is provide resources, trainings, capacity building um, on the work that we all do. Uh, and one of those things is, is advocacy. And I think that we all you know, may take it for granted given, given where we are on that spectrum uh, that, that we can do policy advocacy, we can even do some lobbying. Um, but one of the great resources available um, to, to all sorts of people engaging in advocacy on the C3 side uh, is Boulder Advocacy. And Leslie uh, is going to be joining us today to go through a, re a refresher on some of the basics of nonprofit advocacy, uh, as well as uh, we wanted uh, Leslie to talk a little bit about, you know, funding and sustaining the work and, and, and some of the, the things that they've learned um, and know about that given their, their expertise and uh, experience in that. Um, so we'll be doing, we'll, I'll be turning it over to Leslie here um, and then we'll sort of, uh, uh, you know, have, have uh, she'll, she'll do her presentation then we'll do a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, as, as with everything, uh, feel free to get up and stretch your legs. When you smell the churros coming out, uh, feel free to go grab some of them uh, and get a refresher on coffee. And uh, with that, I welcome our guest, Leslie Mark. Thank you so much, Nate. It is wonderful to be here. I'm joining you all from DC. Nate, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, Leslie, we can hear you. Can you hear us okay? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Great. And I got to see a little bit of the end of the discussion from your Missouri um, government affairs folks. That was really interesting. Thank you all, Nate and McLean and Health Forward for inviting me to join you all today. With that, I'll jump in. I'll go ahead and, and share my screen. And I don't know if Nate said we would be sharing these slides out and the resources afterwards. I'm one of our senior councils that works at Alliance for Justice, which is a 501c3, like many of you here. We also have an affiliated 501c4. Um, but I work primarily with Alliance for Justice, and our program, our department that I work in is, is Boulder Advocacy, and we support thousands of nonprofits and foundations across the country and internationally in terms of um, shaping public policy, how much lobbying they can do, how they can engage with elected officials, how they can um, shape public policy, participate in ballot measures, and even participate with candidates and in candidate elections to the extent of their tax exempt status. So while we work primarily with 501c3 foundations and public charities, we work with a lot of 501c4s, 501c5s, labor organizations, and even organizations that are not yet incorporated and not yet have formed their tax exempt organization. And so if you are here representing a for-profit organization or someone who is with an organization that has not yet applied for tax-exempt status, um, I hope that you'll find this training and discussion informative as well, because you too can apply for foundation grants. And we'll talk about how the rules, the tax rules, impact the advocacy and the activities that you can do with tax exempt funds. As Nate said, we have a hotline and that hotline number is listed here. We have attorneys that are um, fluent in multiple languages, um, primarily Spanish, but we are expanding our offerings in multiple languages. We have a website that has free resources, toolkits, cost sharing agreements between C3s and C4s, list sharing agreements, all of the resources are free to download and use. They're creatively commons licensed, so please feel free to use those. Some of the questions that we can answer through our hotline, 
We have 10 attorneys across the country, and even though we cannot be your attorney, we can provide legal guidance so we can help explain what the law says so that you can make an informed decision and maybe narrow down the questions you need to take to an outside counsel. So if you're wondering whether you can post a communication on social media, whether you can share something from a 501c4 or from a candidate or elected official, you can give our hotline a call and we can help walk through the rules that apply. If you're wondering whether your organization has appropriate grant funding that allows you to lobby and influence um, legislation, we can help look over your grant agreements or help look over the proposed communication, joint sign-on letter, letter to the editor that you're thinking of joining, signing, um, drafting to determine whether or not it is nonpartisan, whether it's a lobbying or non-lobbying communication. Those are just a few of the questions that we can help answer. Today, Nate and McLean and Health Forward asked if we could come together and talk about um, a few issues, such as when does policy advocacy rise to the level of lobbying? How can you maximize your nonprofit's ability to lobby or the ability to lobby with tax exempt funding? How can you fund your lobbying? And when do you need to register as a lobbyist in Kansas or Missouri? And so those, oops, apologies. Um, and when do you need to register as a lobbyist in Kansas or Missouri? And so those are kind of the topics, but please feel free to drop questions in the chat and we will answer them as we go. I want this to be your discussion. So before we jump in, I wanted to reassure folks, nonprofits can absolutely advocate for policy change at every level of government, federal, state, and local, even internationally. We're going to be talking a lot about advocacy and what does advocacy mean? When does advocacy rise to the level of lobbying? And what does lobbying mean? So first off, when we're talking about advocacy, it does not have a legal definition. But in general, advocacy is support for an issue or a policy that creates lasting systemic change. And here we have an example of a group of families whose loved ones were killed from no-knock warrants in um, Missouri, and they are joining together in advocacy with the Arch City Defenders, a 501c3 public charity in Missouri, and they are joining the mayor of St. Louis as she signs an executive order, something she has the sole discretion to sign as the elected executive, and she's signing an executive order banning no-knock raids and no-knock warrants in her city by police officers. This is just one example of advocacy that community members and nonprofits can engage in, and it has the ability to save lives. However, when you're talking about engaging in policy advocacy with tax-exempt funds, you need to be aware of the rules because tax law governs and regulates the type of activities you can engage in with tax-exempt money. What do I mean by tax-exempt money? <clears throat> I'm referring to either the money that your nonprofit brings in as contributions. Most nonprofits have applied for tax-exempt recognition from the IRS. Tax-exempt status is simply recognition from the IRS that your organization or the organization that's funding you does not have to pay federal income taxes on the contributions they receive and generally on their investment income if, if they're fortunate enough to be able to invest their income from year to year. They're exempt from federal income taxes. So these tax-exempt entities, which most nonprofits are, not all, um, these tax-exempt entities have to follow tax rules that apply to tax-exempt entities. And tax-exempt entities are supported by taxpayer dollars. So Congress has a say in what you can do with the money, the funding from tax-exempt entities. And so that's where tax lawyers like myself come in into play. 
I never thought I would be a tax lawyer, um, but I love the strategy that it allows us to do and the support that we can give to all the work that you all are doing on the front lines. The very first rule that you guys probably have known since you've ever started working with a public charity is that tax-exempt dollars cannot be used for partisan purposes, cannot support or oppose candidates in a candidate election. My 501c3, your 501c3, cannot support or oppose candidates for president, for governor, for school board, for city council. Can't support candidates even internationally as well. But there's a whole host of advocacy activities we can use our tax exempt dollars for. And this chart shows a range of advocacy activities that 501c3 public charities can use their money for. So we see on the far left under the red stoplight, um, partisan activities supporting and opposing candidates is off limit for public charities. However, lobbying's in yellow because it's limited and you have to use unrestricted funding for lobbying any activity that tries to influence legislation. And we'll get into the nuances and the definitions of lobbying here a lot <laughs> in this, in this um, discussion. But then all the activities in green are what's considered non-lobbying advocacy. And you can use your restricted grant funding. So if you've ever read a grant agreement and it says this money cannot be used for lobbying, and you're wondering what you can use the money for, here are some of the activities in green that you can use your restricted grant funding for. You can use it to get to know legislators, to introduce legislators to what your nonprofit does. You can attend and host educational conferences, like what we're attending now. You can encourage people to vote on a nonpartisan basis. In other words, you're not trying to encourage who they should vote for, but simply encourage them to vote or explain the voting process to them if the laws have changed. You can engage in training of community members. You can even try to influence administrative regulations that come through agencies, rules and regulations. You can engage in advocacy to corporations, businesses. You can try to get them to raise minimum wage or provide healthcare benefits to LGBTQ employees. You can join litigation. There's all sorts of non-lobbying advocacy and you can do some lobbying with your tax exempt money, but you have to track it. You have to report it to the IRS. You may have to register as a lobbyist in your state and you have to have unrestricted funding. So you have to be able to build your organization's budget and make sure you have some unrestricted funding that allows you to lobby. And you have to be able to track your lobbying so you don't exceed your lobbying limit. What happens if you exceed your lobbying limit? Does anyone know, can anyone drop in the chat? What happens if a public charity exceeds their lobbying limit? Let me look in the chat. Plus, this gives me a, question, a chance to take a drink. What happens if a public charity exceeds their lobbying limit? We, we have no takers here live, and okay. no one's in the chat. So we're, we're waiting anxiously. OK. Oh, do we got some? Oh, oh. somebody? Did you hear that, Leslie? I did not. Can you repeat it, Nate, what they said? Uh, she said, you have to pay some tax and that corresponds with the amount you went over that you spent. Woo, awesome. Yes, um, somebody is super aware. Yes, that is one possible penalty is that if a public charity exceeds their lobbying limit, they would incur what's called an excise tax, a financial penalty on the amount of excess lobbying that they engaged in. Yeah. Um, anyone else know, is there a po another possible penalty? Uh, we had another person shout out in the room. You can lose your uh, public charity status. Yes. And so that, if you lose your tax exempt status, your C3 status, you almost lose your ability to exist. 
you would become a for-profit organization. Um, you actually cannot then transfer and become a 501c4. There's a prohibition against that, but you could become a for-profit organization. But for a lot of public charities, that could be really difficult to achieve your mission as a for-profit organization. And so for a lot of organizations, losing their tax exempt status might mean losing the ability to exist. Um, now, those two penalties are, I don't want folks to fear lobbying, but those are two possible penalties. And that's why it's really good to track your lobbying. All of this is self-reported. Um, so at this point, we're talking about, you know, hypothetical, if the IRS was to lobby you, um, there are some things you can do to reduce the likelihood that you would, one, either be fined or two, lose your tax exempt status. We simply don't see it happen very often, but your funders want to look at your 990. Your lobbying is reported on your organization's 990 form, which is your annual information return. So if anyone wanted to call, I could show you where you could look on our 990, on your 990 form to see how much lobbying different organizations are doing. It's on the Schedule C and it's on line five on, on the second page of the 990. Um, and so your funders are looking to see how much lobbying you're doing if you're reporting it. Um, and so just wanted to put that out there. So you need to track it and you ultimately have to report it at the end of the year. So we've been talking about lobbying. And so this is um, simply a working definition at this point of lobbying to, to kind of get us going. And then we'll jump into the more nuanced definition. But when we're talking about lobbying for the IRS purposes, for reporting on your 990, for your grant purposes, from grants from private foundations, community foundations, that means and is defined as activity that tries to influence legislation. And legislation includes working on government budgets, bills, and ballot measures. Ballot measures are those questions on a ballot that are answered yes and no, like legalizing marijuana or uh, independent redistricting commission. They're not candidate questions. And so you are allowed, public charities can lobby. They can encourage people to vote yes or no. They can encourage legislators to vote on legislation or introduce or oppose or repeal legislation, but they have to track it and they have to have unrestricted funding. So when we looked at that chart, remember the red, yellow, green, advocacy is a huge umbrella. There's all different types of advocacy that supports policy change and lobbying is just one subset of advocacy, partisan, Activity supporting candidates is another subset of advocacy, as well as administrative, regulatory advocacy, corporate advocacy, litigation, um, all sorts of educational advocacy, all falls under the umbrella of advocacy, but lobbying is just one subset of it. So lobbying is legal, but it's limited. So how much lobbying can you do? That depends. The amount of lobbying your C3 public charity can do depends upon the way your public charity has elected to track its lobbying. Every public charity, except for houses of worship, can elect one of two ways to track their lobbying. The majority of you here fall under this, what's called this insubstantial part test. It's the default test that every public charity, when they apply, for tax exempt status when they file their 1023 form um, years ago when your nonprofit um, you know, filed with the IRS, you fell under this insubstantial part test. And that means your public charity can engage in about three to 5% of all of your budget and all of your activities can be devoted to trying to influence legislation, lobbying. That's not a lot because really Congress wants you to spend the majority of your time and the majority of your resources on charitable activity. Charitable is defined as educational, scientific, religious, 
things that relieve government burdens, fight discrimination. There's a whole host of activities that are defined and meet that definition of charitable. If you're not sure, we can always talk offline. But in the 1970s, Congress passed another option for public charities that do some public policy work. And that test is called the expenditure test. And every public charity, except for houses of worship, have the option to elect under the 501H election. It does not change your tax exempt status. You're still a 501c3 public charity. But now it, you only track and report your expenditures, the money you spend on lobbying. And it allows you to spend up to 20% of your annual budget on lobbying. Now, I say up to 20% because it's a sliding scale. So the majority of public charities only have an annual budget of $500,000. So that means you could spend up to 100,000 of it on lobbying. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but yeah, do we have a question? I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. I'm looking in the chat to see. Okay, maybe not. If okay. you're not sure which test or which way your organization is tracking lobbying, you can ask your executive director or someone on your finance team. You can also email the IRS to see or mail the IRS to see if your organization has filed the form 5768. It takes about six weeks and there is a backlog, so it could take a little bit longer. Hey, hey Leslie, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you can, I don't think you can hear the questions, so I'll have to like, Thank you. Re, like repeat them back to you. Thank um, you. But we had, a, we had someone ask a question about fiscal sponsorship and uh, it was, if I'm, yeah, hold on. 60% applies to each sponsored organization and then applies higher fiscal sponsorship. Okay. Um, for fiscal sponsors, does the 20% apply to each individual organization or does it apply to the total uh, uh, spending of the fiscal sponsor? It's the total of the sponsor. So if your sponsor has taken the 501H election, then there's a lobbying calculator that we can plug in your sponsor's annual budget and find out how much direct lobbying they can do and how much in grassroots lobbying they can do. And your sponsor can divide up that lobbying cap any way they please and give so much to each one of their sponsored projects. They could give it all to one sponsored project or they could hopefully divide it up among their sponsored projects. So you need to talk to your um, uh, program officer or project manager um, and so what she's asking is, um, for some organizations, they don't have their own tax exempt status, but they are sponsored by another organization and they operate under another 501c3, um, 501c3 tax exempt status. So the sponsor does all the, generally the administrative work, the sponsor files 1990. And so sometimes a fiscal sponsor will sponsor multiple organizations, multiple projects. And so you take under that project um, and the project divides up its lobbying, um, lobbying budget. Thank you, Leslie. That I believe that answered the question. Sure. And sometimes in your fiscal sponsorship agreement, you may want to spell out how the how much lobbying you can do. Uh, and sometimes it's just an oral agreement with you and the sponsor. But sometimes you can do so sometimes that may allow you as the sponsored project, you could do all of your activity could be lobbying, right? Because the project, the sponsor could have tons and tons of excess lobbying that their projects aren't using. So they could give it all to you um, if you were lucky or fortunate, or if that's the way you wanted to structure it, the agreement. 
And so just a word um, about those who are not, not, not 501c3 entities. So you're, you don't have a standalone 501c3 and you're not um, a sponsored project. So we're talking about 501c4 entities or for-profit organizations, people who are maybe startups formed as for-profits. This workshop still applies. You can still lobby. You may still have to register in Kansas or Missouri as a lobbyist um, based upon the regulations. And you still can apply for community and private foundation grants. But the second bullet point applies to you. You cannot use private foundation funds to lobby at all, ever, if you're a non-C3. This doesn't apply if you're a fiscal sponsor, because remember, you're taking through another C3s um, or a C4. Um, but do know that if you are a for-profit organization that has a charitable program, maybe you're doing a documentary, a charitable documentary, maybe you're running a food kitchen, if you have some sort of charitable program, you can still apply for private foundation grants and they can make you a grant. Not all private foundations are willing to do this or set up to do it, but there's a special rule that allows private foundations to make a grant to for-profit organizations that have charitable programs. It's called this expenditure responsibility rule, but you have to promise not to use the funds to lobby. So you'll have to have other funding to lobby. And we'll talk about other sources of funding, such as you know, private donations, fee for services, membership fees, membership dues, but you can't use the private foundation grants to lobby if you're a non-C3. So you have to understand what is and isn't lobbying because you'll have to report back to the private foundation what your non-lobbying activities were, your charitable activities. So let's take a look at the two definitions of lobbying. Remember the insubstantial part test and the expenditure test. They're similar, but there are some strategic differences. So the majority of you here are probably non-electing. Maybe your organization has not yet taken this H election. And so these three bullet points here, these are the activities that are going to count as lobbying, that you're going to need unrestricted funding for, and you'll need to track either on a timesheet or some sort of lobbying report so that at the end of the year, your staff person, finance person can complete the 990 and report to the IRS how much lobbying you did. The first bullet point, any communication to a legislator designed to influence legislation. The second bullet point is if you're encouraging the public to contact legislators to influence legislation. We'll look at some examples. And the third bullet point, which is all encompassing, public advocacy in support or opposition of legislation. Simply talking about the benefits or the detractions, pros and cons of specific legislation. So this Instagram post here from Kansas Action for Children would amount to lobbying under the insubstantial part test. If you can see it on the screen, it says Kansans agree, it's time to expand can care. That's a type of Medicare under the state of Kansas. They're mentioning legislation and they're expressing a view on legislation. That's lobbying for a non-electing public charity. But for those public charities that have taken the H election, you look at the two types of activities that amount to lobbying. One is communication with a legislator expressing a view about legislation. This Instagram post is a communication with the public. It's not directed to a legislator or a group of legislators. And the second bullet point that talks about what is or is not lobbying, communication to the public, expressing a view about legislation, and including a call to action. And we'll go through what a call to action is, but there's no call to action here. 
even if you follow this link, expand can care, there was no legal call to action. So I know uh, John Wilson from Kansas Action for Children, he just messaged me right before this began and he said he had to step away. But I happen to know Kansas Action for Children has taken the H election. And so oops, for electing public charities, this type of Instagram post supporting specific legislation is not lobbying. So they can use restricted grant funding. They can engage in this type of legislative campaign. They don't have to count their staff time engaged in creating these graphics as lobbying. It's a little more strategic. It allows them a little more opportunity to engage in advocacy that doesn't count as lobbying. Now, the non-electing public charities can still either, you know, reshare a graphic or communication. They can, they can create and they can um, create communications like this. Just know that it counts as lobbying. So they have to have the unrestricted funding. They have to track their staff time. They have to count it as lobbying. Any, I know that's, that's kind of a lot. We just threw the whole definition of lobbying at you and we haven't kind of broken it down, which is what we're gonna do next. But I wanted you to kind of see up front the two different types of public charities that, that we've got in this room, because I think you're both represented here. Um, what we're going to do next is break down those elements that we went through. So here are the two different definitions. And everyone here who works for or volunteers with a nonprofit is gonna fall into one of these two camps, non-electing or electing public charities. And so the IRS tells us that the elements of lobbying involve a communication. A communication is any method of transferring information from your organization to a recipient. A communication can occur face-to-face -face, in writing Remote, online, and even light images can be a form of communication. So anytime your organization is involved in communication, you have to start thinking, are we involved in potential lobbying? And anytime that communication um, is going to leave your organization, and even if it's internal planning, we'll see why you may have to start tracking that communication. Because if it's going to be communication that's going to be shared, you're going to have to do the analysis. So this is the first element, communication. The next element is whether it's a communication to legislators or about legislation. So first we'll look at legislators. The IRS says legislators are found at every level of government, federal, state, local, and it includes their staff, their surrogates as well. So you can't get off the hook simply by calling Representative Andre Carson's LA legislative assistant and asking them to introduce legislation. That would still be lobbying, even if you call their surrogate. And down here in the bottom right, you'll see members of the public sometimes yeah. count as legislators when you're talking about ballot measures. Those are those questions on the ballot that the public are asked to vote yes or no on, such as legalizing marijuana or raising property taxes one cent on every thousand dollars of assessed property. And the IRS says sometimes the elected executive serves as a legislator when they're formulating legislation. So if Governor Laura Kelly is formulating her budget and you are asking her to put something in the budget or keep something out of the budget, you're involved in lobbying. If you are asking President Biden to appoint someone to his cabinet or to appoint a federal judicial nominee or someone to the Federal Reserve Board, you're involved in lobbying. Or if you're asking the Kansas mayor to veto an ordinance that the city council has passed, you're involved in lobbying. 
there's lots and lots of policymakers, both elected and appointed, that have the ability to adopt policies that have the force and effect of law, but your advocacy to them generally won't be lobbying. So these individuals here, if they have the authority to take the action that you're asking them to take, and it doesn't involve a vote by the legislative body, then your advocacy to them is not lobbying. So let's take school board. If you are advocating to a local school board to adopt a curriculum or to remove a school superintendent, that's not lobbying. But if you're asking a local school board to contact their state legislators to repeal corporal punishment in your state, spanking, that would be lobbying because now you're asking them, that's grassroots lobbying, a form of, you're asking them indirectly to help formulate legislation. So again, if you're talking to these types of elected and appointed officials, and they have the authority on their own to take the action you're asking them to take, then your advocacy to them is not lobbying for IRS purposes, and you can use your restricted private and public grant funding. The other question, are you involved in trying to influence legislation, specific legislation? So what amounts to specific legislation? Definitely, once the bill's been introduced, that's specific legislation. We'll also look at proposed legislation in a minute, because that counts as well. Then sometimes individuals, people that have to be nominated and confirmed by a vote of a legislative body or even one chamber, that counts as specific legislation too. Um, work on a government budget, that counts as specific legislation as well. But there's lots of policies that have the force and effect of law that don't count as specific legislation. So your advocacy around them doesn't count as lobbying. So you could use restricted grant funding to try to influence administrative rules and regulation, not lobbying. If you're trying to influence executive orders, not lobbying. Got it? Any questions so far? I'm just waiting, Nate, to see if there were any questions. I think we're good. And I'll just use, yeah. So what's, what's the distinction then that has school board being exemption for you to have something specific, but you can't make that same Yeah, we had a, a question about um, why school board members even though they're elected officials, um, are not considered to be legislators when you make an ask of them, as, as opposed to you know states or local or national um, elected officials. That is a really good question. Um, so while you cannot support school board candidates for election, because that would still be considered partisan, even if they run on a nonpartisan basis, which is weird. It's just crazy tax law. Um, school board members are not considered legislators. It's not considered a legislative body for the IRS purposes. Um, it's just kind of an exception that's carved out. Um, We're not making law like, it's like internal and and if you have questions as they come up please feel free to write them on a card and that way i can just like easily read them off when when leslie has a question i know she's stopping that at times when when she has them but um yeah i'll, I'll be able please to just like yep um Another interesting one that is um, not legislatures, we've got like police merit boards, we've got um, 
trying to think, ICE, um, immigration boards, um, health. Maybe what I should have put down here was the health, um, like local health boards, state health boards, um, the state um, education boards. Now, if you're asking like the state board of education to do something they have the discretion to do, not lobbying, but if you're asking the state board of education to support legislation, that's lobbying. So that's kind of why I have this asterisk here is these folks are generally not legislators, but if you're asking them to weigh in on legislation, then your advocacy to them, or they could be involved in formulating legislation. Um, so it's the question really is, does the, do these folks have the authority to do the discretion, do they have the discretion to take the action you're asking them to take, like curriculum, superintendent on school boards, and on the health boards, like, if, if they've been appropriated money um, from the state legislature, and then the health boards have the authority to kind of divide up the money to community projects, and you're applying for that money now, your advocacy to a local health board is not lobbying. But if you're asking like the local health board to um, weigh in on the state budget, that's lobbying. Um, so sometimes that's why, like, give us a call on the hotline if, if you've got a question like that you're not sure of. So let's put it all together with some examples. Um, first, we're going to take the non-electing public charities, the ones that have not taken the 501H election. So let's look at this op-ed. It is a letter to the editor asking Governor Kelly to veto a piece of legislation. So that's as simple as it is. It's just an opinion piece by a public charity asking the governor to veto legislation. And I'm asking you, is that op-ed or letter to the editor, does it constitute lobbying for a non-electing public charity? And these next three bullet points, these are the three, or if you'd rather, whoops, here are the three, just to remind you, here are the three um, types of activities that amount to lobbying, communicating with legislators, encouraging the public to contact their legislators, or public advocacy supporting or opposing legislation. So if you go back, is this op-ed, um, opposing legislation, is that lobbying? Does it meet the definition? I, I think the consensus is yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is lobbying, an example of lobbying, and a non-electing public charity can write this op-ed. They just need to count the staff time it took to write the op-ed, um, a portion of the overhead that supported the staff time to write the op-ed. However, if you have taken that 501H election, sorry, now the equation's a little bit different. So same op-ed, encouraging Governor Kelly to veto the bill, but you only have two questions to ask. Is it a direct communication with a legislator? No, because it's a public communication. Or is it a communication with the public um, encouraging them to contact legislators? And no, I know you can't see the full opinion piece, but it's not asking anybody to take action. It's not providing a phone number. It's just simply an opinion piece why the bill is bad, why the governor should veto it. It's not lobbying. So let's look at... Um, the, the second type of lobbying for electing public charities, because we haven't really gotten into what amounts to grassroots lobbying and that call to action. And so the IRS says, once you've made this 501H election, it is only lobbying if you communicate to the public, reflect a view on specific legislation, and you include a call to action. 
So on this next slide, we're going to look at what is a call to action. The IRS says it is a call to action if you have one of these four items in your communication. You are asking people to contact their legislators, simply saying, call your rep, call your senator, or you're providing um, providing um, a, an address, an email address, a Twitter handle, some sort of contact information for the public to contact their legislators. It could even be a switchboard number. Or you're providing a mechanism, a way for people to communicate with their legislators about the legislation. Um, back in the day, this used to be if you went door to door and you collected postcards or signatures on a petition to support or oppose legislation, and then you delivered the petition or the postcards to the legislators. Nowadays, it's an online postcard, an online petition. And then the fourth call to action is identifying legislators that are opposed or undecided on the legislation. So if you have one of these four items in your communication to the public and expressing a view about legislation, you have engaged in what's called grassroots lobbying. You can do it. You just need to track your um, track the staff time, track the money that went into creating that communication. If, however, you leave off the call to action and you're an electing public charity, you can be strategic in the early stages of a legislative campaign and you can use other words. You can drive people to your website. You can get people to sign up. You can see how active your supporters are. Um, we see HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, do this a lot with federal legislation, like trying to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I think I said that wrong. Trying to pass the, um, I got the legislation wrong. Um, but we would see them, they would, they would create just short of grassroots lobbying. It was a communication expressing a view about legislation, but then they would encourage the public like, you know, join us, um, visit our website to learn more. And what they've done is they've had their staff create these graphics as non-lobbying graphics. And then as the bill gets closer and closer to a vote, then they add the call to action on. So their staff time, the majority of their staff time was to create these graphics non-lobbying. And then they used a small amount of staff time to add um, you know, a graphic that says, here, call this number, 1-800, or call your rep and have a, a link um, to a way to look up your representative so you can contact them about legislation. So it's a really strategic way once you've taken the 501H election um, to apportion out your staff time and the majority of the staff time will be spent on non-lobbying communications. And then as you get closer to the vote, then you can add on the call to action. And you know the most of the money that most public charities have is going to be non-lobbying funding. And so the idea is to build your funding and to build your legislative campaign primarily around the non-lobbying advocacy. And then with the limited lobbying funding, the unrestricted funding you have to use it strategically. <coughs> Let's take a look at this one and you decide if this would be lobbying for your organization to share this tweet. And by the way, when you share or retweet something, the IRS says you are treated as though your organization had written this tweet. So in other words, I'm asking you, would this tweet be lobbying for your organization to post, to share? So the answer is going to be different for everybody. <laughs> Awesome. I heard somebody say for the H election, it would not be lobbying. Yep, that's right. If you didn't have the H election, would it be lobbying? That's a good question. What does a non electing public charity think? What 
my students from my content. I I the I'm hearing that since it's not not giving contact information, it is, it it is, is giving is. since it is giving contact information that it would be considered lobbying for those organizations that do not have an intellectual. That's not what you're I don't know we're, it, people are mixing it up right now. We're, we're oh, talking. oh, you know what? I may take back what I said because this Twitter oh. handle. It has contact. It has our Twitter. It has handle. contact information hey. for the governor, who may be a legislator when formulating legislation. <laughs> <laughs> Look at everybody paying attention here. Way to go! Way to go! <laughs> you guys stumped me. You guys caught me sleeping at the wheel. So, okay, let's take this first for non-electing public charities. Um, does this amount to public advocacy around legislation? And this maybe jumps the gun a little bit, because if I understand it, your legislation has Kansas's legislative session started or has this bill been introduced yet? No. Nate, has that bill been introduced yet? No. Okay, thank you, no. Okay, so this gets us to before legislation has been introduced, does commenting on a legislative proposal or a legislative initiative count as lobbying? Sometimes. Hey, um, hey Liz, yeah. We had we had a question um, sure. come up on the card. It said, um, if it just said to Governor Kelly and not at Governor Kelly, would it still count? Ah, that's a okay. So we'll modify it here in a minute. Um, we'll keep it as it is now and we'll work through it and then we'll, we'll take that person's question and we'll modify it that way. That's a good, um, a good like follow-up. Um, so because this bill has not been introduced, we've got kind of an extra wrinkle and that is we're talking about a legislative proposal. And I thought I had a, hang on one sec. I thought I had a slide on it. Let me see. Ah, here we go. Something counts as specific legislation, even if it's not well defined, if you have identified a problem and a solution that can only be accomplished with new legislation. So if there's a variety of ways to solve your problem, and you're talking about um, a proposal, you know, if you're talking about decriminalizing marijuana and maybe a prosecutor has the discretion to decriminalize it or the legislature could decriminalize it and you're talking about we need to decriminalize cannabis that maybe is not a specific enough legislative proposal because there's multiple solutions to it right both legislative and um like prosecutorial discretion but in this case, let's see, sorry, I can't get my computer. To, here we go. Um, uh, eliminating taxes on diapers, feminine hygiene products, and groceries, I think, if I understand right. Um, is there any other solution other than a legislative solution? And I need help from you guys. You guys know the issues better. We've heard lots of no's. Okay. Okay. So this is probably a legislative proposal. So this is probably lobbying for the insubstantial part groups because it is public advocacy around a legislative proposal. How about for um, the electing public charities? Is it communication to the public, expressing a view on legislation or legislative policy, and including a call to action? 
And I think we've got a yes here that I had overlooked initially because the call to action is providing Governor Kelly's contact information. So yeah, it's lobbying for both groups. But then we had a question from the audience that said, what if instead of the Twitter handle, we just said a proposal from Governor Kelly should get some attention um, without her Twitter handle? And then it would still be lobbying for the insubstantial part groups, but it would not be lobbying for the electing public charities because there would no longer be a call to action. Does that make sense? But, but both groups can lobby. You can lobby with unrestricted funding. Just track it and report it. I don't want to scare you guys away from lobbying. I just want you to be able to recognize it. Unlike me just a moment ago. <laughs> How about the next one? How about this one? Would this be lobbying? We'll do first in substantial part, non-electing. Yes, we've heard some yeses. Okay. Yes. And you guys can read this okay? It's big enough? Yeah. There you are. Okay. Great. How about for electing public charities? What do you say? Yeah. I, I think the rooms. It's, I, I think I think we're saying yes because it says act now. And there's a and there's a the sending an email to legislators too. There's a call to action. Yes, send a quick email is the call to action. And if you followed this link, it would be providing um, a method to contact your legislators. It'd be one of those online, you know, enter your name and your e and your home address, and it would it would tell you who your legislators are. Um. So yes, this is lobbying for both electing and non-electing public charities. Um, so do it, lobby, um, just track it and make sure you have the unrestricted funding for it. Yeah, you guys got this. Um, they're not all this easy, right? Some, some are more gray, I will give you that. <laughs> um, so thanking a legislator can be a little bit tricky. While, while session is pending, thanking a legislator can often be lobbying because the bill is still alive. But thanking a legislator after the bill is enacted. So after session is over, the governor signed it or it's become law without his or her signature, then thanking either the governor or the legislator, not lobbying. That's pretty clear cut, not lobbying. So if you don't have funding, you can do, you can do this. <laughs> um, we covered this slide. So let's look at some of the lobbying exceptions, because these are exceptions that the IRS says you all can take advantage of, even private foundations. So if you only have grant funding that says you cannot lobby, you can still take advantage of all of these activities. They do not count as lobbying. The first one is what's called nonpartisan analysis study and research. And it's most often thought of as a research paper, but you can get creative. It doesn't have to be a research paper. That's just primarily what we see. The IRS says, if you do a full and fair discussion on the issues and you provide a way for the public to fact check your original sources and you broadly disseminate your research, and this is how you can get creative. Most people broadly disseminate it by putting it in a research paper and putting it on their website, but you could create a documentary. We've seen people do radio shows, Twitter storms. So think creatively when you're broadly disseminating <laughs> your nonpartisan analysis, study, and research. What it says is you can express a view, I should have included, on legislation. So you can actually come out and say, 
Kansas you know, legislators should support House Bill 1001, or we need can care, you know, to expand Kansas Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and if you've taken the H election, it can even include an indirect call to action, which is to include the legislators that are undecided or opposed to the legislation. Um, and so this can be used by both electing and non-electing public charities. Just know that the electing public charities, and I'll, I'll flesh this slide out a little bit more before, we, before I send it to Nate and before he circulates it to everyone. Um, so hey, then, Leslie, yeah. Leslie, we had a question from the audience about uh, a tracking. And, and if you want me to wait, because you'll talk about that in a second, I can. Um, uh, but it was about how, how do you track time for like retweeting a tweet that takes like less than a second? That is a good question. So the IRS does not have any, um, any set system for tracking your time. They simply require it to be reasonable and consistent. So you, you don't want to change your method of tracking like multiple times of the year to game the system. The, the one thing the IRS does require is that you track your time and expenses. And so what you could do is you could say, okay, we're going to, like in our organization, we only track our time in 15 minute increments or half hour increments. And so you could ask your staff to keep track like little tally marks. If you're retweeting several lobbying tweets, maybe when you get to five of them, maybe then you log it as a 15 minute direct lobbying or grassroots lobbying. And I know it only takes one minute to retweet it, but if you think about it, it takes a little bit longer to like read it, process it, go, okay, yeah, we support it. Um, so maybe it takes a few minutes, but you're right. It only takes a couple minutes. And so that's why when you're resharing people's um, communications, it's a really light lift for your organization. And so it really doesn't take up a lot of time lobbying, but you do need to track some of it. You need to kind of come up with a way to estimate it. Maybe, you know, at the end of the day, your communications team will go, okay, I maybe spent a half hour and it doesn't hurt to over-report it. The thing you don't want to do is you don't want to under-report. So if your comms team is constantly retweeting lobbying communications, and then someone looks at your organization's 990 at the end of the year, and you say, we didn't do any lobbying, that's what could get your organization you know, being scrutinized by the IRS or someone files a complaint is if you don't report any lobbying, but I can go on your Twitter stream and I can see you guys are lobbying. You're just not reporting it. So you need some mechanism to capture that. Um, and we have a, a, um, a guide, it's called Keeping Track, which kind of has some sample timesheets, some sample reporting. Um, forms in it that you can borrow from um, that kind of, you know, give you guys some ideas and ways to track that. We also have organizations that have built in um, ways so that their comms people cannot even post anything online until they track everything that they share online. Is it lobbying or non-lobbying? And if they're a C4, is it partisan or nonpartisan? Um, so some organizations have built that in, um, custom, custom built it into their, uh, to their communication systems. Yeah. yeah, tracking is a little bit different for every organization. Um, the, um, the second exception that every organization might be able to take advantage of and doesn't count as lobbying is what's called technical assistance. And this is for the IRS's exception to lobbying. Each state, both Kansas and Missouri, have a slightly different definition, and we'll get to that here in a minute. 
But um, the IRS says that if a legislative committee, not just one legislator, but if a legislative committee or subcommittee invite you in writing to come and testify or to provide information, um, and you provide the information to the committee or subcommittee as a whole, um, you can express a view on legislation and all of the prep time and all of the time spent providing the information doesn't count as lobbying. The key is the invitation has to come in writing and it has to come from a committee or subcommittee. What this means is you can use restricted grant funding. So if you don't have any funding that allows you to lobby, um, what we get asked all the time is what if one legislator asks me for our opinion on legislation? And it wouldn't fall under this exception. Um, it can be really difficult to provide statistics on legislation without providing your organization's view on whether you think the legislation is good or not. But it may be possible. Your organization may be the type that simply provides statistics. And if your organization is one that simply provides statistics and does not provide a view, right? No adjectives, no, no expression whether the legislation would benefit or hurt the community, but is straight up statistical. Um, then you may be able to respond to the legislators' questions in a way that is non-lobbying. Um, a lot of the groups that we work with are advocacy organizations, and I think it would be really difficult for them to respond to a legislator's question and not have it be lobbying. Um, however, that's not to say when we get to both Texas and or Kansas and Missouri's um, regulations on whether you have to register as a lobbyist and report those activities, they have a different technical assistance exception. So what we're talking about now is, can you use your grant funding for this, right? And what do you have to report to the IRS? So right now we're kind of talking about the overall um, because the IRS limits how much lobbying your organization can do. And so that's kind of the first layer of the onion we have to peel, so to speak. Hey, but, hey Leslie. Sure. Since you're on the subject of um, needing to register as a lobbyist or just track the hours, um, yep. uh, we, we had someone ask, uh, we have the H election, but also contract with lobbyists. Do we need to also register as lobbyists or just track our hours? And and I figured you'd ask, what are you in Missouri or Kansas? And so I asked that individual and they said they're in, in both states. Lucky you. So both in Kansas and Missouri, if you designate someone on your staff, if a nonprofit designates someone on your staff to represent the organization as a lobbyist, even if you hire outside lobbyists, then you may still have to register as a lobbyist, like that employee or the organization may have to register. But if, um, if it is simply your outside lobbyist that does all the advocacy for your organization, um, then in those two states, you may not, right? The employees may not have to register as lobbyists. Um, the organizations, there's something as like a principle and every state is different. And so I've got a link to resources for both Kansas and Missouri. And so what we're talking about now is you still have to track time. So let's say someone on your staff is preparing um, research. It, it really helps if I have an example. Um, like work on that legislation to repeal the um, tax on groceries and feminine hygiene products. So let's say you've got three staff members that are working on that legislative campaign and you've got an outside lobbyist. If those three staff members are doing prep work for the outside lobbyist, the IRS is gonna require you to track the prep work that the staff is doing because preparation to lobby counts as lobbying as well. Yeah. 
Um, um, and we also had another one come in while you were talking through that. Thank you for that answer too. I hope this isn't throwing sure, you sure. off. No, no. Okay. Um, someone asked if volunteers or clients of an organization lobbies, and this person specifically said they take the H election, um, does, do they have to report those people's hours to track? Um, for example, the hours that the volunteer spent lobbying as part of their overall lobbying? Ah. Can you read, can you read that one more time, Nate? Sorry. Yes. Uh, so this organization takes the H election ah. and, and they asked if, if volunteers or clients of, of their organization lobby, do, does the organization have to report those or, and track those hours? I've got good news for you. Electing public charities only have to report on their 990 to the IRS their expenditures for lobbying, money they spend. So volunteers can lobby on your organization's behalf, and it does not count against your lobbying cap. So board members, volunteer board members, or just straight up community volunteers that lobby on your organization's behalf don't count as lobbying, don't count against your organization's lobbying cap. However, um, one of the two states, okay, here, Kansas. Kansas, do you see here this next to last bullet point? Kansas does require volunteers of a nonprofit. So if the nonprofit designates a volunteer as their primary lobbyist, then that volunteer has to register as a lobbyist. Um, so this is different than reporting to the IRS. This is different than whether or not you can use restricted or unrestricted grant funding. Now what we're talking about, and so let me, let me kind of show you here. So the IRS limits lobbying, right? Puts a cap on how much lobbying you can do, either the three to 5% for the non-electing or the up to 20% for the electing public charities, right? That caps or limits your lobby. The state of Kansas or the state of Missouri simply wants to um, disclose certain types of lobbying to the public. That's the sunshine law. And so they're gonna regulate and require certain people to register as lobbyists when you engage in activity that meets their threshold. And so what we're turning to next is whether or not you have to register as a lobbyist in either the state of Kansas or Missouri. Every state's got a different um, lobbying registration and reporting um, structure. And so in Kansas, we happen to have a state resource. In Missouri, we don't, but I have a link to um, Missouri's got a good guide online and some training. Um, so in Kansas, Kansas regulates, um, let's see, both direct and grassroots lobbying where Missouri only regulates direct lobbying. In Kansas, they regulate both paid and volunteer lobbyists. And now if you look here, where the IRS only cares about legislative lobbying, Kansas cares about all sorts of lobbying, lobbying of legislative, executive, administrative, and judicial action. So if you're playing in any of these arenas and you work or volunteer for a nonprofit and you've been designated by that nonprofit as their primary lobbyist, the one to interact with these government officials, you may have to register as a lobbyist. But don't let that scare you. That simply means you register and you file periodic reports. Um, I think in Kansas too, you may have to wear a badge. Um, this is where I am, I am so not a lawyer licensed in either one of these states, but please look in these guides. The guides tell you whether or not you have to identify yourself as a lobbyist by wearing a badge. I'm just trying to highlight some of the, the key points and differences between the two states. And then in Missouri, um, 
If you are designated by the nonprofit to represent them as a lobbyist, you have to register, but it's only if you're paid by the, um, uh, when I say paid by the nonprofit. So it doesn't govern volunteers. Um, and then the question is, does the organization, the nonprofit itself have to register? You need to check into that. And then just like the IRS has exceptions, each state has exceptions to what has to be in the lobbying report or what triggers legislation. So if your organization is doing minimal advocacy, you may fall below the registration threshold, such as in Missouri. If you are simply, um, uh, let's see, engaging in public testimony. So if all you're doing is providing public testimony in committees, you're not going to have to register in Missouri. But if you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations with those legislators in Missouri, and you're designated as the primary lobbyist in Missouri, you're going to need to register as a state lobbyist um, and file some periodic reports. Um, I, again, we don't want it to scare you. Um, here is the, the guide that I mentioned before on keeping track. This is kind of the IRS guide, so we're switching back. Um, I'm happy to try to take questions on the state registration, but again, I'm not, I'm not licensed to practice law in either state. Um, Missouri does have online training, and we worked with a fantastic attorney. Um, we also worked with Kansas Action for Children, who gave us a grant to put together a guide in Kansas. Um, and the name of the attorney we worked with is in this guide on Kansas. Um, we're working on, I think maybe this year or next year, we'll have a guide for Missouri, but we just don't have one yet. We're, we have about 26 states already on our website. Um, uh, for states. Uh, yeah. That, that's something we'll make sure to, along with the slides, pass along to everyone. We, Thank we you. also have another uh, question come in from sure. the audience. They're, they're bringing the substance today. Let's let's. I let's appreciate it. it. Um, uh, this one is: if we ask a person with lived experience to testify at a hearing and reimburse them in the form of a gift card, Love do it. we have to count that as a lobbying expense? And they are a non-electing organization. To provide testimony about their lived experience. In their testimony, are they expressing a view on legislation or talking about current law? Yes. Which one? Sorry. Current law or, uh, or pending legislation? They are impacted by the snap drug dollar ban. And they're sharing their experience about that and why that should be reduced. Okay. Yes, it's current law. They're sharing their experience oh. about why current law should be repealed or, oh. or got it so if all that person was doing was sharing their experience about current law why current law is bad that would not count as lobbying but it sounds like they were talking about why the law needs to be repealed and talking about why a law needs to be repealed actually counts as lobbying. So yes, you would need to um, track that reimbursement as a lobbying expenditure. That's the kind of stuff you can call our hotline for. That's the stuff that's not as black and white. But that's a great question. And so sometimes knowing that, maybe then you help craft their, um, their testimony a little bit, right? Like if you don't have money for lobbying, then they stop short of asking for it to be repealed. And they just talk about why the current law is bad. But you also don't want to silence them, right? You can lobby. You just have to make sure you've got the funding for it. You guys want to talk about funding or are there other questions? I'm happy to take questions too. I, I think, uh, yeah, given that we're, we got about 10 minutes left, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go into the funding advocacy and we can answer. Okay. We did have one question. Hold on. Oh, sure. There's a lot of us here in different paths in terms of like our personal views and our organizational views. Um, and then there's 
We had a question about, you know, the fact that a lot of us wear multiple different hats, you know, and when we're expressing our views on something, do we need to make it clear that we're expressing this view based on the organization that's our employer, an organization that we might be um, like a, a volunteer or an appointed member for or a personal view? That's a great question. Yes, you should. Because if you're testifying in your personal capacity, it's not attributed to your organization and it doesn't count as lobbying. And in neither state would you have to register as a lobbyist either. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't advocate for anyone working off the clock. But if you absolutely, your organization does not have funding to lobby and you have folks that are willing to do a little bit of work in their own time, that may be a way as well. So our organization loves to talk about lobbying, if you couldn't tell. And lobbying is legal for nonprofits and it's legal for private foundations to fund lobbying. Um, so we wanted to talk about some of the different types of ways to fund your lobbying. There's lots of ways outside of grants too. So let me just get some of those out of the way. If you are an organization that can charge a fee for services, then that fee could be anything that furthers your charitable mission. We've seen community action agencies weatherize homes, go in, they're skilled and they understand whether my furnace is efficient or not, um, or change um, old inefficient light bulbs to efficient light bulbs, and they charge $50 to do it. A fee for service. Nonprofits can charge a fee. We charge a fee for workshops. Um, the fee, one, has to be reasonable, and two, it has to further our charitable mission. Um, that fee for services is money that can be used for lobbying. Light bulb moment, hopefully. Um, second, um, individual donations. So if someone clicks on your donate here button um, and they don't restrict that funding from what it can be used for, those individual donations can be used for lobbying. Membership fees, membership dues, even if you charge five or ten dollars a year. Um, if you're an organization that has a lot of community followers or community members, think about charging a membership due. Um, generally those membership fees can be used for lobbying unless you promise that you won't use them for lobbying. Don't do that. Um, and then some other ways you can fund your lobbying are through grants. Now your grants have to be unrestricted. So you've got to read the grant agreement. Some foundations, both community and private foundations will fund lobbying other foundations are not comfortable doing so. And so you will probably have a combination of grants, both restricted and unrestricted grants. You can never use government grants for lobbying. Never use government grants for lobbying. Um, and so hopefully you're not fully funded by government grants. Otherwise you're just gonna have to come up with non-lobbying advocacy. And we, we do some trainings for, for groups like that. Um, but there are general support grants, and as long as they are not earmarked for lobbying, and as long as you didn't talk with the funder about using their funds specifically for lobbying, and the grant agreement is unrestricted, as long as it doesn't prohibit you from using it for lobbying, you can use general support grants for lobbying. 100% of those funds could be used for lobbying. You just have to have the discretion to use the funding for it. And then specific project grants, they fund up to the non-lobbying portion of your project, but those funds can also be used for lobbying as long as they're not earmarked and as long as there's no restriction on not using them for lobbying. We can help. We have a number of resources that help you craft your grant proposals and grant agreements and grant reports to be able to use them as broadly and as 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 most unrestricted as legally possible. 
And then there's a type of grant at the very bottom called expenditure responsibility grants. These are the only type of grants that legally must be restricted and cannot be used for lobbying. And these are grants from private foundations to non 501c3s, to for profit or to C4 or to C5 entities. And those legally have to restrict the funds from being used for lobbying, according to federal law. So real quickly, a grant is earmarked if it is given pursuant to either an oral or written agreement that the grant will be used for a specific purpose. So when, when you are in the very early stages of talking to a program officer about what sort of project they might help support and fund, you always want to be talking broadly about your policy advocacy work. And you don't want to say, we will use your funding to get legislation passed. Because right there, if you're talking to a private foundation, they cannot fund your work because you will have just earmarked it for lobbying. We have a workshop all around applying for grant funding. If you, we have both public workshops that you can take and we can customize them. We also have resources. You can just download from our, re from our website. Public charities, which are community foundations, they can earmark grants for lobbying. They just have to count it against their lobbying limit because community foundations are just like public charities. They can lobby. So they can transfer their lobbying limit to any other grantee. Um, let's see. Let's see, you guys can read in our guide. This is a specific project grant. Um, so you have to provide what's called a project budget. This is not your overall budget for the whole organization, but just a project budget. And you would get a grant from multiple foundations and each one is up to the non-lobbying expenditure. But once you have that funding, then the money, as long as it's not prohibited from being used for fund from lobbying, could be used for lobbying and the private foundation does not incur an excise tax and neither do you. It is a legal way to fund your lobbying. And then this is just a reminder that private foundations can fund non-C3 entities, but their money cannot be used for lobbying. So if you're here as a for-profit organization or a C4, you'll have to find some other way to fund your lobbying, your legislative work. Um, just wanted to remind you that we are here to help. Um, the IRS limits how much lobbying you can do with tax exempt dollars and the state laws do not limit how much lobbying, but they require disclosure. So if you meet their thresholds, you may need to register as a lobbyist in their state. So I really appreciate Health Forward uh, bringing us all together and I'm checking the chat. Oh, five more minutes, got it. Nate, I hope we are at time. Are we yes, ready? we are. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, really appreciate it. Very, very well done. Very well done, Leslie. Um, and I just want to, again, plug Boulder Advocacy's resources. A ton are available free online. Uh, they have a hotline that you can call uh, with some of the really sort of specific questions that were asked earlier. Um, and, and as well as um, that, we, we are also continuing to engage with Boulder Advocacy as uh, part of our capacity building and uh, just overall support uh, for, for people doing work in advocacy and lobbying um, who are nonprofits. So it's, it's wonderful to have them as a resource. Um, and I know we've all been here for a bit. Um, so I'll be very brief as in just a wrap up. And I uh, just wanted to say again, thank you all for showing up. It's a Friday. Um, it's a beautiful day too in January. I know we're all probably still digging out of our email inboxes uh, from the holiday break and we're prepping for um, a lot of upcoming legislative activities. So the fact that you all showed up today and sort of gave your undivided and, and really engaged and asked a lot of good questions um, is heartening to see. And I feel like we're building towards something. And I just, the, my parting words will be this, whether you're on the Missouri or Kansas side, we are going to go through a little bit of hell 
and we're going to feel a little beat down. We're going to be sick of playing defense and we're going to be wanting to go do something. But this, if, if not for us, then no one else. We are here. We are holding the line and let us strengthen our resolve as we continue to do this work and do it better and do it more precisely and do it more strategically and do it more in collaboration with one another so that we can actually go on offense and get some wins down the line. So thank you all for being here. Have a safe travel back to your home and work.